Good afternoon, Axe Cincinnati. Uh, welcome everyone to our virtual forum. Uh, my name is Dan Maloney. I am the president of Axe Cincinnati. I, I think most of you know me. Uh, we're really happy that you decided to tune in today. Uh, we started these forums about six years ago. Uh, the original idea was to give uh, judges uh, a little bit more, uh, an opportunity to learn about the areas that they were critiquing a little bit more and to identify observables in shows uh, to help write stronger critiques. Uh, we also wanted the group presidents to be able to come and offer feedback on the judging program and also to have an idea of what we are looking for when we come and judge uh, a show. That has evolved over the years to having people talk about their areas of expertise where we all can learn something. Uh, I feel like these forums have gotten stronger every year. Um, I thought last year's was our best one to date and I'm even more excited about the pre presenters we have lined up here today. Uh, so with that, uh, we this is a broadcast, uh, but we do encourage people to ask questions. You can ask your questions by typing into the comments on the YouTube and we'll be monitoring those and uh, relaying those questions to the presenters. And I think that's everything. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Lorraine Catlin, who is chair of the Long Range Judging Committee. Thank you, Dan. Um, I'm very excited to welcome all of you as well. And I'm gonna introduce our first presenter. Um, our first presenter retired from p and &D in 2014. And since then, he has focused strictly on the passions of his life. For 30 years, Forrest Goodwin has immersed himself in sound. He began mixing sound in a church setting in 1991. He continued running sound systems for schools and churches, and he began venue designs for those entities, as well as for bars and for music venues. He has also served in a professional capacity as a DJ. He's been doing studio work in the area of sound, and he was a sound mixer for live bands and concerts in both the small and uh, large venues. Now, Forrest refuses to call himself a theater expert since he came to this art form only about five years ago. But that expertise that he's had in the past has been greatly welcomed, especially in the areas of major musicals. Forrest has worked with Marymount, the Aeronaut, the Carnegie, Miami University, and he is currently the tech director for Footliners. Now, lest you think sound is his only passion. He holds firmly in his heart his high school sweetheart and now wife, Amy, his two children, his two dogs, and the current front runner for his affections, his three-year-old granddaughter, Ursula. So here to present, hear ye, hear ye, the skills needed for sound execution. Take it away, Forrest. Thank you for that uh, very uh, kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I'd like to everyone to encourage everyone to make my presentation as full screen as you can. There's a lot of detail that uh, I want you to be able to see. I'm going to move very quickly through this presentation because I have a lot of content, but we'll have a chance for question and answers at the end. I won't be able to see your chat as we go through this presentation. Uh, first of all, I was asked to talk about sound execution, but I'm going to talk a little bit about both design and execution because I think they go so closely hand in hand to help each other to create the show that you want to see. Uh, so let's start right into... I know you've left the theater at one point and had this thought, I didn't hear anything bad, so it must have been a good job uh, for sound. You know, regretfully, that's painfully true. Uh, often it's very difficult to be judged on the absence of a negative. But what I hope to do today is give you a glimpse behind the booth, help you understand what, um, you know, the difference between design and execution is, what we're doing in terms of techniques to provide that flawless show for you and actually enhance the show and make it more appropriate to the director's vision. And then finally, I think it's appropriate to talk about degrees of difficulty. Each show has a, a different level of, of difficulty associated with it. And I'll let you pick out what makes a show difficult to do versus easy. I won't say any show is easy to do from an execution standpoint, but there are certain tier points that make it more difficult. First of all, design versus execution. I'm going to create my own definition because I've heard every definition in the world. And so I tend to do both the design and the execution for a show. So I think of anything I can do before opening night as design. 
everything I can do to enhance the sound, make it clear, and make the sound execution easier is a design job. Show nights are execution. I'll tell you here and now, for most shows, particularly anything that has more than 12 or 10 uh, actors, execution is much, much more difficult than design. This may be different than what Chad will tell you with lighting. A lot of work goes into lighting design versus executing uh, the cues. Execution is a lot more difficult in, uh, in sound. Let's talk first though about sound, sound design elements. First, we have the cues and effects. These are the bells or the wind blowing or the crocodile noise that you hear. What you need to look for here is how many layers are there to the sound? You are typically not buying uh, a sound clip that has what you want. Typically a sound clip that you can purchase is only five to 15 seconds long where you need a minute and a half of a thunderstorm. You need several different types of thunders. You need types, different types of wind gust. You need rain to come in. You need to, rain to sound differently. And then you need to overlay these in a, in a way that sounds natural for your background of, of thunder and storm. Let's listen to an example here for and walks layers. through the historic streets and rings the bell of Mr. and Mrs. Morris Pitkin. Yes? How do you do? My name is Chubby Watts. May I ask, have you ever heard of me? Not that I heard of. Well, I'm a radio comedian, and I have a brand new show on CBS starting this Saturday night at 6. Will you be listening to it? Only if you can make a pot roast. Is that anything like roast ham? Not in this neighborhood. I'm trying to familiarize myself with New Yorkers, and I wondered if I could come in and say hello to your family. So in this particular clip, I'm not going to pay, say that this is perfect since I did it and uh, did it for Broadway Bound, but you need to listen for the different layers. You have two different actors. These actors were recorded their parts at two different times in two different recordings. You have a doorbell ringing. You have the door opening. You have laughter. Yes, it sounds like a laugh track because it's supposed to sound like a laugh track, but you can't have the same laughter every time they make a joke because then it sounds unnatural and repetitive. So you need different kinds of laughter. Then you gotta take all these separate recordings and space them out in a space that seems natural. You need to make the two actors have the same volume and you know a hesitation between ringing the doorbell and opening the door. So all this is layered into one recording that you can play during the show. Second, you need to uh, see whether the clip is appropriate to the director's vision. Is it consistent with what you um, are expecting or is it taking you out of the moment? Also, where's it coming from? We want to hear an oven timer go off sounding like it's coming from the kitchen. We're going to get into a little bit later what this means uh, as far as barriers and the ability to do this. Also, obviously the appropriate volume. Sometimes this is more difficult than you think. Uh, if you have leaves rustling in the background over a five minute segment, it's very difficult to get the volume loud enough to be heard, but soft enough to where it doesn't become a distraction to the actors. And uh, so obviously volume plays a role. Sound design can also do a lot to improve the clarity and the character of the voice. We use a tool called equalization, EQ. Uh, this is, in the simplest terms, is your bass knob and your, and your treble knob on your stereo or on your, on your phone. However, you need a greater uh, technique of knowing which frequencies do what, but also it's different for every single person and every single instrument. So as you try to enhance certain frequencies, you have to have a great ear to hear, am, am I making a difference? If you can't hear what you're doing, it doesn't matter how many knobs you know how to twist. You're not going to accomplish anything uh, that helps the thing. Let's take a look at a digital board for a second. Now, don't glaze over on me, this is techie. But what we have is you'll see the 40 in this corner is 40 Hertz all the way up to 10,000 and actually 20,000 is cut off on the right side. That's the range of human hearing from the low to the high. The yellow line in the center means um, that nothing's been enhanced and nothing has been uh, decreased. 
perspective, bass drums operate down here in the 40 to 80 range. Your vocals tend to be 100 to 6,000, along with the high cymbals up there at five and five and 6,000 uh, hertz also. Also, if you're a music person, middle C is about right here. This is also where the body or the uh, natural sound of the vocals tend to come out. Now, when we EQ, this is one example for one vocal. We do this for each and every person because each and every voice is different. First of all, we cut off the top and the bottom. We won't do the cut off the bottom for a bass drum or a bass, but for a voice, nobody can sing below 100 hertz. So any noise coming through below that is just noise. It's a mic thump. It's a hum. So cut it out so you don't hear it. Same thing was true with the high end. Nothing above 8K is, can be reached by a voice. So it's just nothing but hiss. So we cut those out. Right around here is a uh, clarity frequency. You can enhance the crispness of a voice to hear dialogue better by increasing the volume between 3 and 5K. It's a little different for each person again. Here we have at 2K, a harshness frequency. The volume is, is not too loud, but the voice sounds harsh. And then here at the bottom, I have a, what we call boom or character. This is often increased. In this case, it's decreased because the person has a very deep and booming voice, and it tends to echo in the venue that we're in. And so we take a little bit of that off, and what you find is that you maintain the character of the voice, but you reduce that echo. Sometimes we're increasing that to give them more uh, character or make them pop out from the band. Here is the nasal tones, and we'll talk about a little bit of that later when you have sick actors. That happens between 8 and 1.5K. And sound design can actually help with feedback. Um, you think of this typically as a sound execution issue, but sound design can help the, the person doing execution. First of all, speakers and where they're, uh, what content they're playing. You think of a venue often as having just the center speaker or the left and right speaker that you hear in the audience. But re in reality, there's probably five or six or seven other speakers that are going on in the theater that have different pieces of the show. First of all, the band cannot hear the voices on the stage because they're hearing each other. So I usually have one, excuse me, usually have two or three speakers in the band that have the voices only. And sometimes I have another instrument in there where they're spread out and they can't hear each other. Also on the stage, we have speakers pointed at the actors. These do hang, contain the band because they're often separated from uh, the band and can't hear them and they need to stay an exact beat on the choreography. So they don't have the voices because we would feed back if we were sending them voices, but we send them the band. Then you have behind the stage, where people are trying to sing in the ensemble, but they can't hear anything through the wall. So we're trying to pick up elements of the band that we can give them. Well, I don't want to put the entire band there because I usually I have the band too loud anyway, and I don't want to be pumping more band into the theater, but I need to give them maybe the drums or the piano there to let them keep in time. Blocking. I'm going to tell a story on myself that during Mamma Mia, I had, uh, they had a place where they put three crates in the front of the stage, which happened to be in front of the speakers. They got up on the crates and sang, and then it was during the shows that I noticed that occasionally I got feedback. I usually set up the board where I, where I don't get feedback, but I got there. What was happening is normally they can go to the front of the stage and we're good, but by the fact of them moving up two feet, the, seat, the speakers were on the ceiling. And so they were two feet closer to the speaker. The closer a microphone is to a speaker, the more prone to feedback. All we had to do is move those boxes back eight inches and it eliminated the issue. The sound design can set up the mixer board to give some flexibility to increase volume without feedback when the person gets into execution. Let's look at a board really quickly. This is a digital board. I'm showing eight slides. The way to think about this is every single slide, which are these knobs here, represents a person. So if you have eight cast members, you have eight slides. If you have 25 cast members, you have 25 slides. When you 
increase these slides, the sound gets louder. When you decrease them, they get softer. Now you'll notice there's a zero here. We're setting the volume coming into these slides to where these are what we call uh, solo levels. But I can increase them by five. You'll see five on the side. That means five dB or decrease them by five dB. Five dB is about 40% louder. 3 dB is noticeably different. 10 dB is twice as loud. So a little bit of movement on these slides can make a, make a big difference. But what you want to do is set up these slides where I have the ability to move any one of these slides up five and not have feedback. This allows me some ability to adjust the volumes of each and every actor without worrying about am I on that cliff uh, where I'm about to feed back. Um, EQ. EQ, our friend that we just talked about for vocals, can be used to reduce feedback. What I usually do is put all the mics that I'm going to have for a show on the stage. I put them close because when mics get close, they tend to feed back. And there's a point in the choreography where everyone bunches together. Then I increase the volume until I actually create feedback on purpose. Here's our EQ board again. And what you see is a blue line here. That is a very specific frequency that the feedback likes to come in on. It is different for every venue, every type of mic that you're using. Sometimes it's down in the lower end. Sometimes it's in the higher end. Uh, those blue lines, by the way, if it was a vocal, you'll see blue lines across the board and you'll see that at the end of this vocal. Now I'm gonna play a video clip. What we're gonna do is just decrease the frequency here at 4K to reduce this feedback. Now, if you can't hear this feedback, come judge my show. So we notched it out. Now we can talk without feedback. So you saw at the end, my vocal range went from about 100 to 4K and all the blue lines. But by notching out that little bit of frequency, no one will notice that difference in any type of music or sound, but it will give you a lot more ability to increase volume before you hit feedback. Barriers. Let's talk about, well, we've talked about things we'd like to do. Let's talk about things that prevent us from doing it. First is venue design. Every venue is different. Every venue has its positives and, and most have many negatives. Um, and, but every venue is different. Let's take a look at two different venues. The left is the Carnegie. Um, and the right is Miami University where we do our excerpts. The Carnegie is a beautiful place. If you haven't gone, I suggest you do it. However, it was not designed as for shows. It was designed as a speaking auditorium. The Carnegie is one of the hardest places I've ever mixed. Um, it is designed to be like a Harvard room. And if you're not familiar with the Harvard room, it's like, kind of like Union Terminal, where you can sit on one side of the room and whisper, and someone 200 feet away can hear that whisper if they're standing in the right place. There are about a, you know, a dozen spots on that stage where you can stand and your voice is amplified. Now think about a, someone dancing through those spots singing. You suddenly get these blaring uh, volume increases. So I spent about two hours marking all the spots on the stage to find out where these were so that I could duck the slide, bring the volume down as they pass through these areas and provide a more uniform um, show. You also find that the Carnegie has lots of marble. That's what creates the Harvard effect. But for a show, that creates a lot of echo. You have balconies and under the balcony versus uh, in front of the stage, each having a different sound profile. So a very difficult venue to work with, and there's not much you can do about it. Miami University on the hand has acoustical treatments on the ceiling, professionally designed and, and done. They have acoustic uh, materials on the walls. The, the walls expand as you go backwards. All the seats are pretty much in the same space versus under balconies or in balconies. And so I find it very, very difficult to have feedback in, in Hamilton and um, I, I kind of love the venue. However, we're often not in professional spaces like these two places here. We're in churches that have been renovated. We are in a, a um, house that has been renovated or a bar. So what makes difficult things in a venue? 
Larger venues are more difficult than smaller venues. In a small venue, seats 50 people, you probably don't need mics. There's probably not a lot of echo. Larger venue, venues require more volume to be able to be heard. When you create more volume, you're creating more potential for feedback. Square walls are terrible. Most theater designs expand as you leave the stage, but most of our venues are square. That means the sound waves are bouncing off and canceling each other. You get dropouts, you get echoes. Hard surfaces create a lot of echo, and that echo makes it difficult to hear the voices and the words during a song. And there's not a lot the design person can do because acoustical treatments are extremely expensive and very difficult to design. So let's talk about equipment for a second. Uh, separation, we talked about wanting to hear the oven timer go off in the kitchen. Well, often theaters only have one set of speakers and that's for the audience. They, if a, I want a speaker going off in the kitchen, I need to bring it from home as my personal collection. And a lot of sound people don't have speakers sitting in their basement. I only have 22 of them myself. But, uh, you know, this is something that's on the uh, design person if they really want to create that effect. Sometimes you have multiple speakers, but you don't have the ability. They're not wired right to be able to send one sound to uh, one speaker. This was the case at Marymont where we had six speakers, two speakers on the stage, two speakers in front of the audience, and two speakers in the back. But they were grouped. They were going to either left or to the right or to the stage or to the back. What we did was do some work with the, uh, the board and our wiring to be able to send uh, sound just to one speaker. So now we can have things coming from uh, the radio or coming from the kitchen area. Mixer capability. We saw some beautiful stuff we can do with the digital mixer. Most venues do not have digital mixers and they do not have this capability. So an analog mixer looks like something like this. You still have the five slides in the bottom and you have many more slides to the right that I've cut off. And each slide still represents a person. EQ. And I'm zooming in for you and you see you have a high, a mid and a low. Now I can certainly use these to help create a little bit better sound, but I don't have nearly the discretion uh, of cutting in on a, a feedback frequency or providing clarity at a certain uh, frequency for a voice. It's kind of like doing a surgery with a sledgehammer. Band size. We typically don't have a lot of choice of where the band goes. Um, we have about four places, three or four places we can put a band and foot lighters. Uh, but it's typically dictated by the size of the orchestra and whether it needs to be seen as part of the show or not. The easiest thing to mix is canned music, meaning pre-recorded music. I have volume control and I can always pull down the volume and, um, and have the vocals be clean and clear over the music. Uh, the music's also perfectly mixed. The orchestra is doing a perfect job. Next is a separate room. I was able to do this one time at the Carnegie for Civil, Civil War. Uh, the, it requires a lot of mics because you even have to mic the trumpets, but they're completely isolated. And once again, if you work, you can get a very good mix of the band. And then you have a volume control that allows you to pull the band back to a point to where it's easy to get the voices up and over without feedback. Pits do an amazing job. There's a pit at the Arnoff. The Hamilton has a semi-pit. These do an amazing job of keeping the volume down for a band and really helps a sound person. But then you're left with the bands on the stage or in case of Footlighters, a big orchestra is sometimes in the balcony behind the audience. They're much louder in these spaces than anywhere else. So it becomes much more difficult to keep the voices over the band. And in the case of the balcony, I don't want the music coming from behind people and the uh, actors coming to the front. So I try to put some curtains up, put a lot of mics on the band, ask them to play quietly, and then I try to move the sound to the speakers in front in the stage. At the end of the show, I have many people come up and says, are the orchestra underneath the stage or behind the stage? I said, no, they're behind you. And that's one of the biggest compliments I get that I was successful in that feat. Acoustic acrobats. Uh, wireless systems, incredibly expensive. One wireless system costs about $1,000. You're dealing with 24 cast members. You've got 24 mics. You're looking at an investment of $25,000, $30,000. The reality is most theaters have outdated wireless systems that are very old. They're problematic. 
mics are failing, and um, sometimes they provide more problems than the help that they're giving the actors. Let's talk about sound execution. And, and I did a lot on design because it sets the stage for what execution does. If you remember nothing more out of my speech today than this, is that sound execution is not static. It is constantly moving slides to create a good blend and clarity for the audience. And I'm not talking about moving, you know, unmuting five people and moving the slides five minutes later. I'm not talking about, you know, two minutes later. I'm talking about moving the slides every five to 10 seconds. Uh, and if you're dealing with eight, that's one thing. If you're dealing 24, that's a much different thing. Why is it different all the time? Why is it just not automated? Uh, like a light cue, you turn on the light cue, it's the same intensity pushing in, in the same direction. Well, every night's different. How full the venue is has a big impact on the sound. If you have a full house, it is actually a, a great thing from a sound guy. People are great sound absorbers. They suck up the sound. So you have less reverb, you have less echo, you have less potential for uh, feedback. If you have a Wednesday night and 30% occupancy, well, it's going to be louder. It's going to be less clear. It's going to be more difficult. And you need to make adjustments on the board to try to bring more clarity to the show. Second is actors are variable. Uh, I have you know, some very consistent actors that are the same volume every single night. They have the same intuitions. You know where they're going. And I love to, you know, compliment and reward that. But that's not true across the board. Some people are louder some nights. Sometimes they make emphasis on different notes. Uh, we also have sick actors. Do a show in the spring and a cast of 20 people. And you will have a cluster that is sick. And that's when we get back into the nasal EQ. And how do you try to make their voice sound better, plus give them help on their volume when they can't push it? Rotate concentration in the orchestra. First of all, the orchestra's mic'd. Uh, we do this because we usually tip skinny down the orchestra. Instead of six violins, we have two. And so I need to put microphones on the violins and the woodwinds so they can keep up in volume with the trumpets and the saxophone and the drums. Uh, the, a lot of this equipment is also electronic, like the pianos that goes through the boards. But what happens when you uh, practice, you've got the orchestra where you want, someone's sick, someone you have to bring in a substitute, someone couldn't, can't make it. It's a trumpet player. He's playing louder at the beginning of the show than what the previous trumpet players go. It's a cascade effect. I have to bring up the violins and the woodwinds and the other instruments up to match it. Otherwise, I don't have a good mix of the band. Once I do that, the band is louder. So now I have to bring up all the vocal volumes. When I bring up all the vocal volumes, one of two things happens. I am dancing on the edge of feedback now. I've used up that three or four slide headroom that I have. Or if I don't have feedback, I'm sometimes too loud. So you can sometimes correct, correct this at intermission. Uh, the sound director is a very strong partner with the sound man, uh, but he cannot hear what you hear. He is surrounded by his own instrument. He's typically playing something himself. He cannot hear what the band sounds like being in the midst of it. Believe it or not, that's true. So he's relying on you to get the mix right. And this is the sort of thing that can screw you up. This is probably the most reason slides moved constantly is microphone control. I'm going to show you a, a clip by Ingerberg Humperdinck, and I want you to pay attention to what he's doing with his mic. Now, he's one of the masters of mic control, and he does it very dramatically, but you notice he pulls the mic away at the end of his, of his very strong note. This is very typical, and it's, it's done by professional musicians constantly today. Uh, you would, if you go back and look at Nate, Lady Gaga's national anthem, she does it in a different way. She turns her head away from the mic when she hits those big notes. It accomplishes the same thing. You're not distorting and overpowering the mic. Um, because you're belting out something in your range. The same is true on a holding a very long note. 
Typically at the end of long notes, you'll bring the mic closer because you're running out of steam and you want to keep the note sustained. Well, guess what? When the mic is taped to your face, you can't do any of this. You can't pull the mic away from your face. You can't get closer. The slide is what does it for the singer. And so as a song progresses, these moments is where you bring up the slide or pull back the slide to keep the voice you know, in the right character and uh, sustaining that long note. You don't want it to sound like a crescendo, but if you do it right, you can make them hold that note just a little bit longer and drive the audience wild. And I seldom tell the, uh, the actors that I'm doing these sort of things because I want them to focus just on singing, not worrying about what's happening with the mic. But this is one of the main reasons levels are moving all the time and slides are moving on the board. Let's talk about degree, degree of difficulty because not every show is the same. Let me help you understand what's a hard show versus an easy show. Uh, and I don't think there's really any easy shows, but less difficult. Uh, I like to use Ice Skater here because this is something that's judged on degree of difficulty. If you have a skater that's going around in a circle on the rink, it better be a pretty perfect circle. If you have a skater that does, you know, five, you know, quads and several loops, yes, they may stumble on one of the landings or maybe even two, but it's still a superior performance. Now, you don't want to see them fall five straight times. That's a failure. But degree of difficulty plays into sound very heavily, particularly on execution. The biggest factor is how big is the cast? I find the eight is very, very manageable. It can still be difficult, but it's manageable. 12 becomes difficult. When you go from 12 to greater than that, up to 24, it becomes exponentially more difficult. And we'll show you some of the reasons why. Um, think about move, uh, unmuting eight slides. You have an unmute of two, six, and seven. Pretty easy to do. Now think of it when your terms, you need to unmute, you know, three, 14, 17, 22, and 24. Uh, those, you need to find those in five seconds or less. And mute them out before they start talking in the dress room. Uh, it becomes much more difficult. And I'm going to show you that on the board later about how we deal with slide movements when we get past eight. The more mics you have open, the more feedback there is. That's just the way it is. So as you pass that point where we set up the board with six or eight slides that are okay without feedback, how do you do um, 24 slides? Variable spacing. When you have a big cast, when microphones get closer together, they'll feed back. When you have a big cast, there are times where two people get closer together than they did the night before, and you get you know, feedback due to that. Oh my God, mic failure. Um, we have people that, you know, the tape releases from the face, and the microphone's down at their waist. Uh, you have a costume change that pulls the microphone off the face or unplugs it from the body pack. And sweat is our nemesis. It gets into the head of the microphone, you hear gurgling, or it gets into the body pack and, you know, it goes out completely. Now, we try to do a lot of things for these areas to try to minimize this. We show people how to tape. Uh, we anticipate how to do the costume changes. We tape the mic to the body pack. We put body packs in bags, but still, these are potentials that could happen. Also, you have an intermission. They reapply their hairspray and forget to cover their mic and they filled the mic with hairspray. If you hit a mic with your hand or your costume, it's gonna feed back. It's gonna not only pop, but it's gonna feed back if a lot of mics are open. You have bad mics and you have frequencies. The more frequency, more mics you have open, they have to have different frequencies that don't interfere with each other. I had a jazz club open up across the street. They happened to use the same frequencies I was, and during the middle of the show, I had mics go bad. So the way to think about this is if I got eight actors and eight mics, I have a reasonable chance to get through 12 shows without any of these mic failures happening. However, if you've got 24 mics on stage, then, you know, it's not if you're going to have feedback or if you're going to have a failure, it's when you're going to have a failure. And then how do you, what do you do about it? One of my most scary moments is when I open up the chorus and I'm unmuting 18 slides at once. And then one of those mics is gurgling. 
which one? How quickly can you find which mic? I can't mute all the chorus. People need to hear the chorus. So you need to quickly track down the one person who has a back mic. Often it's the lead because they're doing the most costume changes and they're sweating the most. What do you do about it? Often I try to increase the, um, the volume of the mics of other actors standing near them. That way I'm picking up him and uh, in their mic, but I got to bring them down if they speak. So often you can't do anything at all, but this is something that's going to happen. Let's talk very briefly about sound clips. Uh, for me, sound clips are a distraction, but it really is based on the context. If I've got one actor in there and I've got a sound clip, no big deal. If I've got a full stage of 15 people out there and I've got my hands on the slides mixing them, then to go over and push a button on the computer and do a clip, it's a big distraction because you lose track of, of where you are. And often in professional environments, you know, you have a second person who's doing those clips. So look at the context of, you know, where those bell rings or alligator noises or whatever is happening is coming into. Second is, you know, even for a play, there's sometimes uh, many, many sound clips and they're coming at machine gun, you know, pacing. Uh, timing is key. One or two second delay after a dialogue line screws up the effect. I think everyone's punched a, a uh, a number or something on the on a tablet or on their computer, and it doesn't go. Well, the same thing happens in sound. You thought you pushed play, uh, you missed it, or it didn't take. But timing is key because that's key to the thing. Now I'm going to be wrapping up here. I know I'm going a little long, but I'm going to just do a few slides to show you how slide movements happen as you get to a big board. This is our big digital mixer. We're not going to pay attention to the 900 knobs that are here. You're only doing a 101 class. What we're going to pay attention to is these 16 slides, which represent the first 16 actors that you have. Recall that each slide is an actor. You move these slides up and down for volume. What happens when you have eight people? Well, I have eight fingers. It's very easy to put fingers on slides. If I need to move the volume up on a person, I'm going to move a volume up. I'm not going to go above 5 dB because that's my limit for feedback, but I'm going to pull back one of the other slides back 5 dB so I maintain the same amount of, of headroom for feedback. But what happens when you go to 12? For a musical, we set up six slides that are solo slides. When I double the number of mics that are open, you have to decrease all the slides by 3 dB. Since I want to maintain these six slides on the left as solo slides at zero, that means these other six have to come down 6 dB. So that means they're 60%, 50-60% wider than the solos. But that's okay because you got six people singing at the same time and they have ambient noise or ambient uh, vocals that help you hear them adequately. What happens then when you go to 24? Well, you again want to maintain six solo slides so that you can have, because there's always a solo line in a big chorus number. Somebody sings a solo, the chorus responds. So now we have to move down another 3 dB, and now these slides are close to 10 dB down, which means they're half the volume. Again, no big deal because you've got now 18 cast members singing and you still need, believe it or not, you still need some microphone help with a large orchestra or that chorus, but you don't need to help them. It's okay that they're half a volume versus a solo because they've got a large group. Well, yes, this is only uh, part of them. Where are the other eight cast members? Up here in the corner, we have a button that shows you the first 16 slides. We have one for the next 16. So we push that button and you'll see on the left another eight slides for the uh, cast. By the way, the up and down slides on the right are the band. In this particular case, I have seven band. I've had as many as 16 slides for the band itself, but this is your band mix. So now we've got everything great, but this isn't reality. This is where the bane of the sound execution guy comes in. Sound writers, I think, for a joke, 
create songs where every person in the chorus has one solo line, and then you have two phrases of the chorus answering, and then a different person in the ensemble has another solo line. So let's say Molly in slide four here has a solo. If I let her do her solo and she's at minus 10, no one will hear her. So I need to move her slide to zero. But if I do that, I'm going to feed back. So I have to go back to the top buttons and move someone else down to minus 10. So you're maintaining six slides at zero at any one point. Now think about moving, you know, one cast member, one cast member every five seconds. One goes up, one goes down, one goes up, one goes down. You can, you say, can you automate this? Yeah, it might be possible. We don't do that. We usually say we have limited number of automation cues in the board. We usually save those for big scene changes when you have 15 cast members leave the stage. Uh, you also want hands on slides for the number of reasons I told you earlier, for mic control, for feedback, for volume adjustments. When I'm going over and, and letting the board do it, you're losing that control. So yes, you're rotating each and one of these slides. So what happens is if I have a trio come in, I have three slides on the right, I move up to solo, I have to move three of the other solos down 10. Think about men versus women. This has constantly happened. But at the end of the day, this is a more realistic view of the board. You have solo slides spread out over 24 different slides with the rest being at course levels. And you're always managing that to prevent feedback, but also to provide clarity for each of those solo lines. I hope I didn't bore you with all this techie detail. I'm sorry if you're glazed over, but I'm gonna stop there and I hope that you please don't do this, even if you're President Obama. And I'm gonna to move to questions and answers. Thank you so much for Hi, everybody. I'm Amanda Emmons Shumate here um, to pop in and um, moderate the questions and answers that are coming, or questions that are coming in on our YouTube channel. First, uh, first comment that came through, by the way, we just wanna give a big shout out. Happy birthday, Forrest. Yep. <laughs> so he's here joining us on his birthday. So. Woohoo! So thanks for joining. Yes, it is literally my birthday today. <laughs> so we're so glad that you took your time um, to join us uh, today. Um, I'm going to give an opportunity. There were no questions asked throughout the throughout your presentation, um, and I'm just going to give uh, our viewers at home a chance to, if you'd like to type in a question that you might have at this time, um, we'd love to see your question. Otherwise, I don't know if Dan and Lorraine, you have anything you want to input in the meantime. I mean, I thought that presentation was incredible. Um, I, I can't imagine trying to keep track of that many different slides and knowing what to do during the course of a show. Um, I mean, I, I just thought the whole presentation was just incredible. I want to second that. I think it was excellent for us. And I think you touched on things that those of us who have some basic knowledge of sound, it helped me to say, okay, I'm going to focus on this, 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 and this when I respond next time, because those are the things that are most critical that you saw as most critical, having to do that all the time. Would you speak a little bit about environmental sound um, that's continuing through a scene or continuing through a portion of a scene where you've got a sound effect that's underneath the dialogue constantly? Just talk a little bit about that. Uh, we don't think of scenes typically as what the show scenes are because the band is usually vamping as the lights go down, et cetera. Uh, we tend to make breaks when there are major changes in who's on stage, who's off stage. Uh, that becomes a scene for us. I'm not sure what you mean uh, the, by the environmental. Yeah, sound effects, like you have to have crickets because you're outside and you want to create the sound of crickets constantly under dialogue or talk a little yeah. bit about having to mix that. Well, I've, um, Typically, um, you're recording, you either buy a clip with crickets or I've taken a microphone out in the backyard at night and you record them. Um, you know, and I've, rec I've recorded doors slamming or, or crockery breaking. Uh, and you put those together, you're on the board mixing the actors. You need to reach over, push the sound cue, and then you have a volume. There's a slide for your, your effects. You know, everything has a slide. Every band member has a slide. Every actor has a slide. The sound effects has a slide. So then I bring that volume in.
to where it's just the right volume. Now, in fairness, uh, say Marymont has the sound booth up in the um, up above the stage. They're listening to the volume through a speaker. That's not really what the audience is hearing because he has a volume control on the speaker, make it louder or softer. So he's at an incredible disadvantage for in execution to be able to change the volume of the sound. So the, the effort comes much more on the sound design person to get that volume right up front. But guess what? He's guessing too because he's doing it with an empty audience. When the audience becomes full, it may be too soft because they suck up all that sound. So you have to do a little bit of projection into what it might be if this is full and where the sound level needs to be. And the sound execution guy may not be able to adjust it. Thanks. For uh, I, by the way, my biggest show was Civil War at the Carnegie. I had 32 cast members. We had the band in the basement. I had uh, 15 slides on the basement. And uh, then we had special effects. So we brought in two mixers uh, to, to get, I think, close to 48 slides going at one time. Um, and yes, I had some missed cues. Uh, <laughs> I opened up 23 instead of 24. When you're trying to do it in five seconds, you can sometimes look up. Again, we try to color code things to make it quicker, but you're in the dark. You're in the dark. <laughs> hey, Forrest, we, um, we got a, a comment, a question on the feed. Um, this comment comes from Mark Culp. Mark says, do you ever preset the levels for specific songs or scenes and then can invoke those presets during moments of the show subject to tweaking? Yeah, uh, we, we use automation. If you have a digital board, again, many, many of you don't. But if I have a digital board like at Footlighters, uh, I use an automation usually at the beginning of a scene where uh, suddenly you're going to have 24 people come on the stage. These are just starting levels though. And it's very unnerving to hit a button and have 24 mics unmute at the same time. If people happen to be clustered or whatever, you can get feedback. Again, there could be a bad mic, but I immediately then go to the slides and make the adjustments that needed for the venue for that night. So automation can get you somewhere in the ballpark, and we usually set it up to be in a safe range, and then use our fingers to get things where they need to be very, very quickly. So um, automation is handy. It is not used very much. Uh, I was talking to Eric this week about how much he uses Eric, Eric Bards, does a lot of big shows too. Both of us agree, we'd rather have hands on slides doing big shows because you're in much more control of where things are going and can prevent problems when you're on top of it. Hey, um, Forrest, we got another great question for you coming from Doug. Doug says, how often do you have the stage manager call sound cues versus handling it yourself as a sound execution person? Um, can you talk about what happens most frequently in theaters that you've been with and what would be easier and harder about each of those aspects? Uh, I've never had anyone call a sound cue um, in any shows that I've done. Uh, I'm not the, again, I only have five years experience, but I've done probably 20 some shows. Um, I have had, this is typically done uh, where you're just, you're not doing microphones, but you're doing sound clips. And so at the Marymont, you're again, you don't see the stage. You're listening through, you know, monitors and speakers. The soundstage person is calling up. I haven't done execution at Marymont, just design. Um, you go up, you know, their stage manager is saying, cue next sound effect. He's hitting the computer button, next sound effect comes up. Um, calling out the cues, you know, for a musical would be a huge distraction because, again, a cue is only, there only may be 15 cues for a show. Uh, but there's a thousand slide movements that are happening, um, you know, during during the live mix of the show. And so having someone buzz in my ear that I need to do something, it's just shut up, let me do my job. <laughs> I've got 48 slides to manage. Don't don't distract me while what you think I need to do. The worst thing in some of this mixing is something does go wrong and it happens. You know, a, a mic goes out. 
you still have 20 cast members on the stage singing and you need to mix them while you figure out what the issue is. Is it a frequency issue? Is it, you know, sweat? Which actor's mic is gurgling out of the 24 that you have? The board doesn't tell you. You have to guess. And you can't turn off everybody till you figure it out. The show is going on. So I, you got the cues that are coming up, a sound effect that's coming up, and you're still trying to sort out what's going on with that bad mic. Um, so it's I find you know mixing for theater very, very challenging versus I've done large, you know, I've done some pretty famous bands and, you know, but you have five guys that never leave the stage. They have wired mics that never go out and you know exactly each song and what's going to happen versus gunshots, screaming, you know, people throwing each other against the wall, all these with microphones and having 24 mics open at the same time is literally insane. It's insane. Um, you know, versus five mics, you know, on the, on the stage. And I also always thought I did cool stuff with bands. And yes, you're doing very nuanced little effects. Nothing, none of that in theater. You're, you're trying to keep the train on the track. And sound really does play such a major part of our experience in the theater. So thank you so much, Forrest, for it, for your expertise today. There are no other questions coming in on the feed. So you want me to answer the mask? <laughs> yes. Actually, that's I completely forgot about that. For everybody that's listening, I had I had personally a question that came up um, earlier. Uh, we're talking about masks because that's just our world today. Um, wearing masks while performing is becoming a thing. And I'm curious to how that might have an effect on sound and how they're going to be approaching that in the future. Well, I, think, I think everyone's seen the issue on even TV professional news press, uh, newscast shows where they have thousands and thousands of dollars to, to throw at things uh, where the person sounds muffled or whatever. This could be a disaster in a musical. Um, I have a show, 1776, coming up with St. X. Uh, I will need to test different approaches for how to mic someone with a mask on because they will be wearing masks as part of their costumes. What we've got opted for are there are masks that have a plastic insert that separates the mask from the voice. What this gives is a space for you to talk like this. Instead of talking like this. So when the mask is right up against the face, you get the muffled voice versus when I cover it with a cage with the mask still over, I think we can get a lot more uh, clarity. We've talked about putting the microphone in that mask. That's a disaster waiting to happen. Every time that mask moves, it's going to rub against that microphone and pop and scrape and everything else. Plus, it's probably going to echo in there. So we'll probably do more uh, miking from the hairline to, to uh, keep you know, the voice and uh, the microphone away from my preferred space on the on the face, but I think the cup mask may be the best answer. And sorry for going long. I'll let you get back to thanks. Thank you so much, Forrest. We appreciate you. Thank you, Forrest. And don't worry. <laughs> We've got little places pocketed in there. We'll just keep on going. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next presenter. Um, our next presenter's international career spans more than 100 productions, and that has included work in theater, film, dance, and music. Chad Brinkman holds a BFA in theater studies, his concentrations in directing and design, and that's from Southern Methodist University. He also has an MA in literature from the University of Dallas. He's utilized his education as a director, a designer, as an artistic director and a producer throughout New York City theatrical and film industry, and also in regional theaters and tours across this country and around the globe. One credit that best represents Chad's expertise is White Elephant. It's a new work. It's brought to life through puppetry, movement, masks, Super 8 film, and live music, and it was at the La Mama. His credits include work at Public Theater Playwrights Horizons and the Atlantic Theater, the Atlantic Theater Company, sorry. And he served as a guest teaching artist for the Goldberg Department of Dramatic Writing at NYU. Here in our little corner of the world, he has done both set and lighting design for Footlighters, lighting design for CMT, and he serves on the board of Footlighters. We are excited to have Chad Brickman share, illuminate the art and craft of designing with light. Please illuminate us, Chad, sir. <laughs> 
Well, thank you very much for allowing me to be with you this afternoon. I'm excited to share with you today a little bit about the art and craft of designing with light. I say art and craft because just like designing other elements or performance-based arts, like lighting is both a skill that you can hone, uh, the craft of lighting, and it can be a deeply expressive medium in the same way that acting, dancing, singing, playing an instrument can be transformative for an artist or an audience. While we can work our craft, oftentimes the art of it is an intangible that cannot be taught. And like most art forms, natural talent is squandered if not paired with hard work, practice, and study that is required to become a master craftsperson. So theatrical lighting in art and in practice is an essential piece in telling the story. Today, I hope to share with you about the purpose of lighting, how it is expressed in both art and craft of design, and how to know when you're in the presence of a good design. I also wanna to talk to you a little bit about the execution of the lighting design and performance, and how to differentiate between the function of the design and proper execution. So let's start by talking a little bit about purpose. Lighting design is frequently a more subtle element of theater production than other aspects of design. Oftentimes, until you're specifically looking for the shifts in light or how light is affecting your perception of a scene, you might not have conscious awareness of it. That's not always the case. Sometimes the use of light makes itself readily known, but regardless, without it, you'd literally be in the dark. So then what is the main purpose of light? First and foremost, it's to illuminate the action on stage. Lighting is needed so that the audience can see clearly what is happening. The audience can't see the actors. Everything else a designer does is, is pretty much a waste of time. Studies have also shown that the visibility of light affects our ability to understand the spoken word. So seeing actors is fairly important. The purpose of light is also to convey setting and time of day. Lighting can be used to help the show, the audience, uh, show where the audience and, and, and actors, where they are in the production, where it's set. For example, a play set in a hot country may use a warm amber lighting to demonstrate that the climate is hot or a cool blue may be used to give the audience that feeling of cold. Lighting can also show different times of day. So for example, bright lights can create that effect of midday while as we lower the intensity of the lighting levels, we may indicate night or afternoon or evening. And although lights are more subtle than the scenery and costumes in giving the location of the play, lights can also provide important information. Lighting design is particularly effective in focusing the audience attention by utilizing a practice that we call selective visibility. The lighting designer makes the stage visible to the audience, but also selects what should be seen and what should not be seen at any point in the play. And that's important obviously, because it allows us to distract or keep people's attention away from something that we don't want them to look at or really look at the intimacy of a moment. Lighting can help to shape the way that we feel and interact with actors. Now I'm gonna continue on with the purpose, but the next few points begin to bridge that gap between art and purpose. Uh, but to me, they still comprise purpose for lighting. So we're gonna keep them in this category. So creating mood and atmosphere. Mood is the evocation in the audience of the appropriate emotion. Lighting can help to create mood and atmosphere on stage for example, to create a cold, damp gel cell, a lighting designer may use a cool blue light at a low intensity. Automatically, we and our brains begin to utilize that, that information, take in that light and feel maybe a difference in, in the temperature or in the way that we are responding to other people around us. Lighting can influence pace. So the lighting designer is important in establishing the rhythm of a production, believe it or not, because the, de the, the designer determines how lights change from scene to scene and within scene and into intermission and to the end of the play. We oftentimes create the button at the end of a song, you know, whether it's a blackout or a slow fade, uh, letting the audience know what their response should be. But also if we're doing quick, fast changes, lighting designing that's flashing or popping, 
that's going to increase the speed, the, the artist and the audience experience and how movement is happening. And if we have those slow languish fades, then oftentimes that's going to keep us focused on the action. We're not gonna be perceptible, the, the, the change isn't perceptible until we get farther down the road. The purpose of lighting is also helped to communicate themes and symbols. In some productions, lighting can be used to communicate themes uh, or symbolic dimensions to a performance. For example, the color red or pink might be used to represent love or romance or danger. And supporting the style of the production is the last purpose of the design of light. Plays in a naturalistic style often use lighting to create the illusion of real life, while non-naturalistic performances often use a more theatrical lighting effect. We call this the idea of reinforcement, and it's important because lighting designers can either create an illusionistic effect, right, by simulating real light sources like the sun or the chandelier or the practical lamp above your head, the sun coming through the window, or a highly stylized effect of lighting that creates environments that really couldn't be real, but to reinforce the themes and ideas of the theater piece. So that's the purpose. These are kind of the reasons why light exists and why a designer is necessary. Next, I wanna talk about the art. For me, it isn't enough that the light simply be a tool to illuminate the stage and the actors. I believe that all aspects of design serve the deeper purpose to reinforce the essence of the story. Lighting serves as art, not for art's sake, but to metaphorically bring light into darkened spaces, to shine on the beautiful and to bring ugly forward from obscurity. Lighting is art manifest in the following ways, through storytelling. I believe we can serve as a character or a kind of third person narrator in a story. In the same way that the omniscient voice of the narrator begins to bring forward those things that the characters may not know or cannot see, light can help the audience to key into the important themes, the ideas and the emotional places and a kind of foreshadowing. Light is also about composition. The act of painting a picture, and in this case with light, Light can create images deeply saturated in color, framed at its edges and presented to the world for critique. It's one of the most important and one of my favorite things about lighting design is to really be able to create along with the set designers, the costume designers, the actors and directors, these beautiful pictures, the things that draw us in and are emotive and evocative and make us feel and respond. The art is also in that creating mood and atmosphere. Simply shifting the color or intensity of the lights will change the emotional quality of a scene. Consider how you feel in a dark gray day in March versus a bright sunny day in July with the warmth on your face. Consider how moonlights and sunsets affect your mood. The ability to create mood through light is one of our most powerful resources. And it's also one of the places where a designer can frankly have the biggest hiccup. Many designers err in paying too much attention to mood to the point where visibility is sacrificed. So finding that balance between can the actor be seen and the mood be set uh, can be tricky. Because we go back to that uh, where we know that, that being able to see the actor is very important to being able to hear the actor as well psychologically and scientifically. We talked a little bit about this earlier, but the art is also in influencing the pace where the designer determines how many lights change from scene to scene and within scene and the transitions into intermission and to the end of the play. It can be used to influence the pace of each piece. Those quick lighting cues can again provide an exciting, dramatic, dynamic energy. Slowing them down, creating slow effects can also calm us calm the audience and allow the audience to experience a moment in a different way. The use of lights can encourage or discourage applause at the end of musical numbers, scenes, or acts by providing visual cues as well. So there's a lot of things that we can do there. And the timing of those things become important, right? Because 
if you miss the timing, if you hit it too soon or too late, or you don't have the, the right kind of decline in light, it can really change the way the scene lands. So you want to make sure that the light in conjunction with what's happening on the play is really helping to reinforce that tone of that scene. The art is also in communicating themes or in symbols. So the last show that I worked on prior to the pandemic closing down um, was of Mice and Men. And in that production, we utilized the set as a kind of oppressive wall that was closing in on the cast that included power lines that echoed the cavalric presence of the cross. So you can see in this picture, this was, the idea was that it was a very tall wall that it would be hard to get out of, that it was sort of closing in and surrounded. And you can see that it, it feels like it's it's a almost a cavern inside of a really uh, agricultural space. But then up above, you have these power lines or these, um, these uh, telegraph lines that have this, this cross effect, this Calvary of cross effect. The show is highly uh, elusive, meaning that, that it, it really harkens back to these biblical images, right? And so we were able to, at different points in time, subtly bring up the light or change the light on that piece above so that cross was more present, hanging over the, the audience um, and hanging over the actors as well to so kind of reinforce those subtle bits of this, this idea of fate. It's, it's an interesting thing to be able to do that. Um, and I love the fact that we were able to do that in this show. Another place where the art is very present, and this is the last that I'm gonna talk about in this section, is the supporting the style of the production. Now, this is important because, you know, as the director and the actors and the writers and everyone decides, okay, this is the, the direction we're gonna take this. This is going to be an ultra natural show, or this is going to be a show that's just completely out there. As you can see two very different shows in the pictures here. One that's, um, uh, highly stylized and the other, uh, this was, this was a uh, rabbit hole that was, that's a, a very naturalistic show. Being able to key in on that using the lights, reinforce lighting effects or creating lights that, that are dramatic and counter to nature is very important. So import, the idea of reinforcement here again is important because the designers can either create those illusionistic effects as simulating real light or they can move into that stylized light. And following these principles help the lighting designer to ensure that the design serves the production and ultimately becomes an important element in bringing that story into reality. Um, I wanna talk just a little bit more about reinforcement here. What does that mean? What are we reinforcing? We're reinforcing everything. Um, a lighting designer has the responsibility to reinforce the playwright's text. So for example, in Midsummer Night's Dream, when Puck has the line, and yonder lights Aurora's harbinger, meaning the dawn, the lighting helps to reinforce this idea of the first rays of dawn. We reinforce the work or the set or the costume designers. We might use colors that flatter or complement those used in our, by our colleagues. And if the sets and the costumes are sculpted in such a way that are lush, or we might light them to highlight their three-dimensional quality or color. We might be able to determine the light through the window as being day or night and really help to, to bring the evocation of, of what's happening in the time of day into the set design in a new way. We also help to determine the level of three-dimensionality that we want the audience to see. Sometimes we want something that's flat, that sort of takes away the sculpted three-dimensional quality of the actors. Sometimes we wanna create something, particularly when there's a lot of dance, that really highlights the sculpting of the body. We may use light, high, middle, and low so that the entire body is shaped and we can see movement. But frequently the most productive way to highlight style is through lighting and it quickly can tell the audience that this world is real or not real. However, like the great impressionist or cubist artists that broke down form and line to bring something completely new, their journey began by learning the basics. That they were first artisans learning their art, learning to work with paper, pen, brush, and paint. Before they could innovate, they needed to know the bedrock principles of craft.
And so that brings us to craft. What comprises craft and lighting? We start with the lighting tools and the instrumentations. These are the designer's practical tools and includes various kinds of lighting instruments, gel, color media, gobos, cables, dimmer boards, consoles, having a knowledge of circuitry in the theater and basic general electricity is important. The most important are the lighting instruments themselves, which fall into a few different kinds of categories, right? So you have those, those spotlight type lights, ellipsoidal or what have you, that really can give you solid, crisp lines. You have floodlights, Fresnels, PARs, those kind of lights that have a softer beam that create a more natural effect or help you to blend better. And then you have new lights, moving lights, LED lights, things that can create infinite numbers of colors and uh, be used in lots of different ways. So it's really important on the craft side that a designer has spent time with these different materials, that they know what the difference between a spotlight, uh, a, an ellipsoidal spotlight or a Fresnel is and what they do so they know how to use that tool that they, they're familiar with how different gobos affect the way that people can be seen, how color and the psychology of color changes the way an audience relates to the world around it. The next thing that's really important in craft is color. A designer must understand color and choose the color of light to create a range of different effects, such as the time of day or a particular mood or atmosphere. But like I said earlier, a designer really has to know and understand the psychology of light and color as well. And the way that color mixes together, which is different than the way that, say, paint mixes together. The absence of all color in paint is white. The absence of all color in light is dark, is black. So if you mix all the different colors of light together, you get a pure white light. If you mix all the different colors of paint together, you get black, right? It's the same thing. So understanding how different colors play together, what looks good on skin tone, how to create effects in shadow, what looks good on fabric. Color is our main tool apart from the light itself. So really having a knowledge of how people react to color, what color looks like on people and in space and on a set is very important. The next piece of craft that I wanna talk about is intensity. So the intensity refers to how bright or dim the light is. The level of intensity may vary from one scene to the next. The intensity of light can give the audience information such as the season or time of day. It's also a means by how we can differentiate between those naturalistic and unnatural effects. You can see in this piece, this is, this is a moment in this particular play that was uh, really, not supposed to live in the, in the world of realism. It was kind of a chaotic dream. And so saturating the stage with light created these unnatural looks on the faces of the people and these crazy shadows. Increasing that intensity had a very different effect than say if we were to light them from a different angle and increase with a warm color, you may feel like a natural day or a dark color and a dimmer light would be night. So intensity. The next thing in craft I want to talk about is position, direction, and focus. The position a light is hung in, the direction it's pointed in, the relation to the actors, uh, it creates a myriad of effects. You can see this is a page from an old lighting book, um, Designing with Light by uh, Michael Gillette. But it's still a great sort of representation of where we put a light to create the best effect on the person and how that changes. So if we put an, a light directly in front of the person's face, you kind of get those weird shadows. It doesn't look natural, it looks a little bit flat. If you light people from either side here, you, you miss that shadow in the darkness. If you light them from just above, you get the shoulders and yoke of the, the hair and the shoulders, but you don't see their face. If you light them in what's called a four key, so you've got something from the front, from the side and the back, they look more natural but they still get some of those unnatural shadows. If you light someone from 45 degree angles from one side and the other, you get a much better look of them, but you lose sort of the shape of them. So when you add in that light in the top and the two lights in the front, 
um, then you get sort of a well-rounded image of a person. So understanding when you're putting together a lighting design and creating a plot, where is light coming from? How is it hitting people? What's the color that's being used? How is it shaping the form? Being able to do all of those different things, keep all of those different things in tension, really allows you to have a good, uh, a good design. So what you want in a naturalistic effect, of course, is an even light all the way across the stage. You can walk from one side to the other. You're not walking in and out of shadows. A person's face is illuminated well. They're shaped well. You see that they have dimension. That's what you're looking for in that really naturalistic light. You can see in this picture here from you're in town where we, in one of those dramatic moments of you're in town, decided to do foot lighting effect and hit them with this unnaturalistic light though. And hitting them from underneath also does something. In general, lighting from above, uh, shining down directly onto an, adder, an actor will, will create a dramatic shadow. From the front, uh, you'll light them clearly. However, you may wash them out some. From behind is when you're able to get those really interesting silhouettes so that the audience only sees their outline. And from the side, um, you, you get just positions, but you may get this interesting wash as well. So just really being able to play with how, how does this picture look? How is this light coming in? Those are all really important things when we start talking about the way that things are focused, where they're hung, the direction that they're in. Focus is also referring to the way uh, the beam of light hits, right? So with one of those ellipsoidal spotlights, you may have a tight or sharp edge that's gonna create a certain look or feel versus a soft edged beam, which is gonna have a more naturalistic effect. Those tight, sharp edges read more artificial, whereas the softer beam can be used to mimic natural light, for example. And the last thing I wanna talk about in terms of craft is using special effects, texture, and transitions. So special effects, um, a lighting designer can use lighting to create a variety of special effects that's required by a production. So for example, quick succession of flashes can be used to create the effect of lightning. Um, while the slow fading of light changing from a warm tone to a cool tone going through reds and oranges can create the effect of a sunset. A flickering light from underneath creates that effect of fire. So being able to utilize the way that light plays off of the body, off of the people, off of the environment around you helps you really to create some interesting effects. Or here, putting a funky green light and using some hairspray creates the, the effect of a ghost in sort of a mist. Um, this was a really fun one to create because so much of it is practical, but it was also about the use of, of uh, a spotlight on one actor to keep them out of the green more than the other actor, right? So you can see where you sometimes have those really close moments. When we start talking about texture, and I'm, I'm a huge texture fan. Any design you see from me is going to be texture heavy, um, or at least you'll, you'll know that it's present. Um, light can be used to create different textures on stage. For example, a dappled gobo, or a, it's a piece of metal with holes cut in it that you put in front of a light, can create the effect of light through trees. So you can instantly be transported to a forest, even if it's just a blank stage with an actor and a light. Uh, it can also provide the stage with some interesting and meaningful texture. Frequently, I'll layer in a gobo across the stage and then light people more, a little more intently. But what that does is that helps to define the body a little bit more. So as you're walking through shadow and light, shadow and light, you really get a better sense of the texture, the shape, the way a person is moving. But if you're hitting them with an intense front light, if you're giving them more intensity from the front, you're not losing that effect of being able to walk across the stage and having the clear lighting. You're just getting something a little bit extra. Oftentimes you don't realize it's there. Sometimes you'll push the texture to create, um, again, more environment like a forest or something unnatural. And then transitions, that refers to the movement between different lighting states, right? So. Um, this might occur in a crossfade where one lighting state fades into the next. So an actor is crossing across from one spotlight to another. Um, the opposite of a fade is a snap where one lighting state moves immediately into the next. So you have something happening here and then something happening here very quickly. Um, but all of these things, you know, understanding transition, um, how quickly a transition, how slowly a transition happens, all affects the way that the light is moving. 
And, and we take that in, right? Whether we're conscious of it or not, we're seeing that light come in to our brains. Our brain is comprehending what's happening. So for example, with Of Mice and Men, that was a show that didn't have many cues really, but it had some really long cues. So through the course of the scene, I may have decreased the intensity of light by 40%. So by the beginning of the scene, it was very bright. By the end of the scene, it was dark, but it took place over 20, 30 minutes. So while you may be conscious of, wow, it feels like it's getting more night here, you probably were not conscious of the fact that the lighting was transitioning. But knowing how we perceive light and how light informs our understanding of the world around us is helpful when we talk about transitions. So studying the craft and understanding how to utilize the tools of light help the designer not only to accomplish the necessary purpose of light, but also to be innovative and to become more a true artist of light as well. In the same way that Picasso first had to learn to draw the human figure before he could become a cubist, um, a lighting designer really needs to understand the tools and, and the basics of good, solid, natural light before you can really become innovative. So what's important to you? Uh, how do you judge the design? What is a good design? I'm gonna give you a couple of questions that I think you should ask yourself based on what we've talked about today. So the first is, does the design fulfill the purpose? So we talked earlier today about the purpose of lighting. You know, can we see the actors? Are we focused in the right places? Um, am I getting a sense of time, and of, of day and place and season and all these kinds of things? Um, are, are they doing those things well? Um, and if you're doing those three basic things well, if you're fulfilling that basic, most basic purpose, then that's good. I mean, uh, you know, not all houses are created the same. You know, Force was talking about that earlier. Some people have a lot of lighting instruments. Some people have just a very few. Some people have more modern technology in terms of consoles. Some people uh, will have a, a more antiquated or, or not quite as, as functional or programmable console. So really judging based on what you see um, and are they fulfilling those basic purposes is a good place to start. The next thing is has the design both reinforced and enhanced the production. And I think this is important. Is it creating mood and atmosphere? Is it helping to establish pace? Does it help to communicate those themes or symbols? Does it support the style of the production? Do I feel like, you know, we talked about oftentimes you don't think about lighting. It's the same thing with sound unless something goes wrong. I mean, obviously you want it to be that way unless it's a very stylized performance. But has the design, is have the lighting in this show really helped to reinforce the things that the story is doing and also enhanced in some way the story. And the last question I think you need to ask yourself when judging a design is, is the design executed well in terms of craft? And I don't mean executed in the terms of lighting execution. I mean, did this designer utilize craft well to accomplish the goals that were set forth? This is pretty much obvious if it fulfilled the purpose. Um, is the lighting, as we talked about, even across the stage? Can an actor walk across the stage in one of those full light situations and you're not seeing light, dark, light, dark, light, dark? Or are they well lit if, if you're using a pool of light to highlight a specific area, space, or a scene? Um, is it a good even lighting in, in terms of a naturalistic or does the light itself help you to, to be able to comprehend the actor well? Are the actors well lit and shaped? And is the use of color, texture, movement, transition, special effects, are they appropriate? If you can answer these questions in the affirmative, then you can feel confident in the design. And if the design is more distracting than supportive, if it works against the story or feels out of place, um, then it's time to question the efficacy of the design, right? A good design is either gonna disappear or function in a way that brings more life to the production. And I think that's ultimately the thing. Is this design supporting this production in a way that's not distracting and doesn't uh, function in detriment to the show itself? And as a side note, as I talked about earlier, you know, not all theaters are created equally. Some folks have that top of the line equipment and technology and others are using simpler or older technology. Um, and it doesn't function as well or burn as bright or provide as many tools. So one of the things I encourage you to do when you walk into a theater, and this is something I naturally do, but I encourage you to do it as well. 
If you walk into a space, look up. Take in the lighting, right? Think about what kind of instruments do am I looking at? Are these new, fresh, clean instruments? Are these older instruments? Um, it's usually pretty obvious. Um, are there a lot of them? Are there just a few of them? I'm a firm believer that shows should be judged on the merits of both the design and what the designer has to work with to accomplish that design. If I'm working in a professional house that has every manner of toy that I might wanna play with, every kind of moving instrument, I'm gonna have a more impressive design than if I'm working in a small theater that has old instruments and a manual board, right? That doesn't mean that I still can't accomplish the purposes and goals of the lighting design. So if I'm using fewer things, uh, but I can still accomplish what I'm doing, then that's a good design. So judge the design on that, not by how fantastic it is in the moment, um, if you know that you're not judging apples to apples. I'd also say the purpose and principles um, are the same. And so if a designer in a small house with older equipment can meet the basic expectations laid out above, then wonderful. Uh, if it's not flashy, but it does serve the purpose and rise in some way to art, then it's well done and should be judged that way. So that begs the question then uh, about lighting execution. For me, and, and Forrest talked about this earlier, he said, you know, light a sound execution is frequently much more difficult than sound design. I would say the opposite is the truth for lighting design. Um, lighting execution for me really comes down to just two things. It comes down to keeping up with the lighting cues and timing. And, and I say that because most modern theaters have a programmable console that allows the designer to program in cues and timing and everything else, and then allows an operator to push a go button to advance to a next cue. These cues are timed to the action on the stage or to a specific line or action, and the operator advances those cues based on where it lives in the script. The cue is either called by a stage manager or the operator follows along and prompts themselves to advance the cue. And making sure that all the cues are correct and you're at the correct cue at the correct moment, um, that's what it makes takes to have good execution in terms of, of the cues themselves. If you, you see on stage, if the lights on stage don't look like they match the scene, if there's an actor standing in darkness and a spotlight on the opposite side of the stage, you can probably determine that we're not in the right cue. And if we're not in the right cue, that's an execution thing, right? Typically that's an execution thing. Uh, but if, if you've noticed that throughout the course of the show, things seem to be trucking along as they're supposed to, the actors are lit as they're supposed to, things make sense within the world of the play, then your, your, your operator is, is probably doing the right job. Um, now, I will say that some shows are more complicated than others. Uh, musicals or large uh, plays tend to be more complicated than smaller pieces. Um, I am one of those designers that will literally program hundreds of cues for a big show. And operators don't like me for that, but you know, that's what I do. Uh, <laughs> but for example, if Mice and Men was a show that had a, a handful of cues, I mean, I think it was less than 50, and it was a show that functioned really beautifully, but it didn't need a lot of flash and, and pomp and circumstance. It didn't need quick movements or those kinds of things. We were able really to do a lot with a little. Um, and so again, it, it can be a difficult task for an operator to keep up with cues depending on how many there are. Uh, but a good operator is someone who's gonna familiarize themselves with the show. They're gonna spend time at the tech rehearsals. They're gonna make sure that they're in all of the dress runs, that they're gonna have watched the show so that they know okay, this is, this is how this show moves. This is where these cues should be happening. I'm following along in my script. And if you see that, it's probably pretty good. Timing, I think, is probably an even more challenging aspect of lighting execution. Being able to feel that moment when to advance the cue is important. Not jumping the cue or waiting too long to push go requires patience. Um, 
I liken it to a musician reading a piece of music, right? Like you can read a piece of music and play a piece of music and that's important, right? And that's the following along with the cues, but, but the phrasing of music itself, right? The way that it's sung or played to bring out the art, the movement of it, the way you may push those notes just a little bit. Um, that's the timing aspect for a lighting, uh, a person who's, who's executing a lighting design. Oftentimes, you know, the, the timing is very tight on a cue. So if you're late, it's gonna make the lighting feel wrong. If you jump an actor's line or you hit it just a moment too soon, it's gonna be jarring, right? As opposed to reinforce what's happening. So good lighting execution, I think does two things. It stays on track in terms of cues and, and you don't feel distracted by the movement of light through the show. The transitions happen the way that they are supposed to happen, the way they feel like they're supposed to happen. They're not taking you out of the moment. Um, and I think those are really the two things that, that I think about when it comes to, to good lighting execution. So judging lighting execution is do the cues appear appropriate in the moment? Um, and is the timing of the lighting changing in line with the story? The trickiest thing here is knowing if the timing of the... So the trickiest thing about timing is because timing is also in the domain of the designer, knowing if the timing is the designer's trouble or the, the executor's issue, right? But since the designer will program timing, if the cue seems to be on the money when it's supposed to happen, but the fade or crossfade is wonky, that's probably on the designer. Uh, if the cue itself seems to be timed wrong, like if the lights change in a moment that doesn't make sense for them to change, that's probably the execution. And mostly I would go back to these two, ex to these two questions when you're looking at a show. I think the designer's job is infinitely more difficult in terms of theatrical design. And so really if you watch a show and you don't feel like you've been taken out of it at all, the executor has done a good job. And I think that's really kind of how to think about that. Um, if the cues are appropriate, there isn't a light in a weird place uh, where there's no actor or something like that, um, then they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And I would say if it feels like there are a lot of lighting cues in a show as well, but they've all been done pretty well, then, then well done because that's a difficult job. So if you're seeing one of my musicals <laughs> that I've done a lighting design for and there are 50 billion cues happening, um, but they all seem to be done well, then you know that's an executor who's worked really hard that show, but they've done a good job. So that's that's it for what I have in way a term of presentation today. I hope that showing you a bit about what a good designer uh, must hold in balance and what an operator must do to execute a design well has been helpful. And I would love to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, we do have some, Dan, or, or sorry, Chad, but um, Dan and Laureen, do you guys have anything to add before I get to the um, comments on the YouTube stream? Uh, I just, I thought it was another wonderful presentation. Um, it is specifically the, the poetry you spoke with in describing uh, lighting design. I, I really appreciated that. And yeah, I'm going to need Chad to, to narrate my um, my stress app that I have. <laughs> I can listen to Chad Brinkman speak all day long. <laughs> yeah, just, I just want a second. That was absolutely excellent. Thank you, Chad. And I just want to say to people that are watching, we are going to take a break. And I know that we're a little bit behind schedule, but honestly, we really don't care. Um, we want to be able to give people the opportunity to ask questions of Chad. So please ask questions and then we'll take a little break and then we'll get to our next presenter. But thank you, uh, Chad. It was, and I, and I, I actually have some training in lighting design and I was like, oh, this is absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a million of suggestions back with me. So excellent. I love what do we got for questions? Well, we've got a few. Um, the first one I want to go with directly relates to our adjudication process, and it comes from Doug. And, and Doug says, can you talk um, about the time it takes to design and build a show? But then he adds on to that, and he says that it's important to understand that building and setting a show at a theater owned by the company, for example, mm -hmm. theaters, versus working in a new space or a rented space. Uh, for example, at the air and off. Yeah. So what what are some particular challenges the adjudicators could could look for and maybe address in their um, in their yeah. responses? Yeah, great. that's that's a great question. and it's it is a reality, right? Um, and I've worked in around the world, but also here in in Cincinnati in both environments, right? I've done shows 
at Footlighters where we own our space and we really could take the time to build the kind of plot that we wanted to really key in the focus well. Um, it's easier to make changes. We don't have to use union folk, <laughs> right? Um, and, and, and we have the ability to make those, those kinds of decisions and planning over a longer period of time versus walking into a space at the Aronoff, for example, where you have to use IA folk. Um, you have to tell them what you want. You, you have hours, not days, to key in a focus and put in gel. Um, I think in terms of the difference there, again, in a space like Footlighters, I'm going to have more time to really be able to think about what it is I want to do and how to accomplish it and try some things and and um, build my plot over a little bit longer time or work with the, the set design to do that. Um, when I'm in a space that's owned, I'm going to have to have gotten their house plot ahead of time and really think through more in the intellectual or the academic sense of lighting versus the practical sense of on paper, how can I accomplish the thing that I want to accomplish? What's it going to take for me to do that? Um, the other thing that's a bigger challenge is that you don't always have the ability to program your show until you're in the space. You know, there is technology that allows you to do that and you can go in and tweak, but not everyone has that. So, you know, in a place like Footlighters, for example, I can take a little bit longer time programming cues, looking at cues, thinking about how cues are supposed to look versus being in a place like the Aronoff where I'm going to have to be quicker, right? I'm going to have to be a little bit more, um, less picky. I don't want to say it that way because I try never to be compromised, but I, I have to be okay with not getting just that thing. It's going to bug me forever, but I'm, you know what I mean? So I think that's a good question when you're going into a space, knowing whether or not it's a rented space or um, it's a space that's owned, you probably are going to get a slightly a better depth in the design and an owned space versus a rented space. However, in a space like the Aronoff, you also have world-class top of the line equipment. So that plays into it as well. Um, a good designer who's able to, to understand the qualities of light in that craft piece, right? Especially working with union folk, um, you're gonna be able to key those things in quicker and it's gonna be a little easier for you to accomplish what you want. So I think those are some of the things. In terms of how long it takes to design and build a show, um, you know, that really depends. I think, you know, when I was working professionally, I tended to turn around a show in, in six weeks. That was my typical. And I would sometimes be working on more than one show at a time, you know. But, you know, that process is a pretty deep process of of reading the play several times, meeting with the director, talking to the designers, figuring out what it is you all want to accomplish that you're moving together on the same page, what the color palette of the show is going to be. So doing all of that pre-production work takes time. Um, actually, once I have a set, putting together a lighting plot is usually pretty quick. Um, I know what I want to accomplish. I know what I need to do that. I can put together a plot in a couple of days. Hanging the show also depends on whether or not I'm in a space that the lighting is, I know where the lighting is when we're starting or it has lighting in the air already. If I'm walking into a situation like the air and off where they have a house plot in place, I know where the lights are. I know what channels they're plugged into or what circuits they're plugged into. It's easier for me to adapt that versus where sometimes, frankly, you walk into to a place like Footlighters and the previous show hasn't changed anything, which is changing, but the previous show hasn't, hasn't changed anything. And so you're like, oh gosh, okay, so this light is here and this light is here and that light is there and I need that light to be over here and this light to be over here and this light to be over here. And you really have to sort of restart from scratch. So I think that that's one of the benefits to working in a place that doesn't own its own building is typically they have house plots in place and you're just kind of you working within the house plot and adding some specials versus starting from scratch. Thank you. We do have one more question from Denise and I think it's a, one that might be a good one to address given our current circumstances. Denise says, with the combination of streaming and in-person possibly becoming a new norm, do you or should you sacrifice the vision and view for the in-person in order to have more clarity for those that are watching via streaming? Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think the approach that I would take in that scenario is how do they handle sort of live 
live recorded sitcoms, right? Um, what's different between live theater and television film, you tend to have much dimmer intensity on film, right? Because cameras pick up light a lot more. So I think it requires the designer to be a little more subtle. Um, and I think the challenge there in a live situation is that, you know, we talked about it, being able to see the, the actor differentiate between time and, and tone and mood um, is harder when you, you have a more limited headspace. So, you know, Forrest talked about how he's got a little bit of room that he can move those, let his sound up and down. The same happens with lights. I think there are going to be some things that are not going to translate one way or the other. And I think you have to decide what's the most important thing for that production. You can create a very even, beautiful production live and streamed that has a little bit of compromise on both sides. Um, or you can go full in one and full in the other. I think that does a disservice to your folk um, who are in person or who are online. So my opinion would be probably to err slightly to the direction of um, that sitcom, which is you still get all the same stuff. You just get a little bit less intensity. So you kind of take the intensity of your show and you reduce it by, say, 10%, 15%. Um, it's going to be a little darker, a little less intense for your in-person groups, but your um, it'll be great for your online and your in-person folk. Hey, Chad, we got one more that I missed and I'm going to go back to and I'm going to kind of tag on to this one because I think for our adjudication program, this might be a good quick conversation to have. Mm -hmm. But Ken uh, is talking about black and white films and yeah. choosing to, to design shows in black and white. Um, I love the comment. You might not be able to go into the details of her actual question, but I want to tag on this question and say um, how important as adjudicators is it for us to look for how a how the lighting design complements a costume design plot. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so you have to think of, of costume frequently fabric as being a projector of light, right? Um, the worst is when people build like these. So, so lighting Hamilton must have been a nightmare because you have all of those white sort of Muslim costumes that um, are gonna read everything. So I, I think when you think about costumes, you know, they're going to amplify light, right? That's kind of one of the things that, I, that they do. So you, your, first, your first goal is really about lighting the, the person, right? Thinking about what looks good on skin tone. But I think there are a lot of different ways that you can light skin tone. So when you're talking to your designers about their color palette, for example, um, if you're, if there's a fabric that's going to look really awful with a strong amber color, for example, then you use a different idea. Like maybe you move more into a pink or a, a, a mixed color that's more of a white or a subtler, subtler sort of yellow or orange to, to light a face, right? So you have to think about that or brown tones, depending on um, the, the actors that you're working with. And so, you know, that's part of it is like having that compromise, that conversation back and forth and also being realistic with the designer who comes in and says, I'm going to do all white costumes. And sometimes you have to say, what? <laughs> I don't think that's a good idea. So it really, that's where that collaboration comes into play. Um, you know, specifically the black and white stuff. Uh, that's really interesting, right? Because you can't introduce color in that context. You really have to think about Again, it goes back to mixing, right? So cools and you mix different color together, you get pure white. So if you're looking for a way to light these sort of film noir plays without just a strict harsh light using uh, diffusion, right? So there's a, a material that you can use called diffusion that just sort of um, creates a smooth, even light, or more importantly, looking at ways to mix color. So if you've got a a mid-color blue, like a Roscoe 62 and a, a Roscoe 02, which is kind of a, a subtle amber color, you mix those together, you get sort of a pure white that, that's not harsh. 
um, and really defines your actors. Also in that term, like uh, brown tones actually can help to bring out the grow the blacks, grays, and whites, interestingly enough. So yeah, I mean, you, you really have to think about it. You wouldn't want to come in with a bunch of color in your lighting if you're doing a black and white show, you know? But the concept, the idea of lighting is still the same. You're still looking to shape your artists and, and, and what have you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Chad, um, Laureen, and Dan. Any last minute thoughts as we end his segment? Nope. That'll. That's. It's just wonderful, and we're very, very excited. And folks that are with us, we're going to take five. We'll be back at two fifty, two fifty one, and do our third presentation. Give you folks a bio break. And thank you again, Chad. Thank you very much. Thank you.
I'd like to welcome everybody back. And Laureen, the floor is back to you. Well, thank you, Ms. Amanda. Um, our next presenter graduated from college with a non-theater degree, and then she promptly moved to New York City where she discovered her true path, for sure. Mary Stone spent nine years stage managing a variety of off-off Broadway productions and countless NYC Fringe Festival shows. She learned firsthand what it means to corral those of us who partake of drama. Uh, since moving back to the Cincy area in 2006, she has dad stage managed for No Theater, The Carnegie, Exile Dance Tribe, TDW, Footlighters, and CMT. She has served as president of Drama Workshop, helping to spearhead their purchase and renovation of the Glenmore Bowl into the Glenmore Playhouse. And she's currently serving as the VP of Administration for Footlighters Board. Um, we're thrilled to welcome Mary Stone for Thank You Five, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love My Stage Manager. We can't, ha can't wait to hear from you, so you're on, Mary. Thank you, thank you, Lauren, I appreciate it. Um, thank you to you and the Long Range Judging Committee for even inviting me to speak on, on this uh, topic. Um, I realized when I was listening to Chad's pedigree that like, I really don't have um, any formal education or training on stage management. Um, I kind of learned uh, as I went uh, in New York, but I, ha I was so blessed to be able to learn from some really amazing stage managers. Uh, and I took things from, from them and created my own toolkit. So um, I do have a lot of passion for this topic. So, um, you know, bear with me. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about the importance of the stage manager, which I think sometimes really we don't understand what the stage manager's role is. Um, and the stage manager's role really is you should you stop worrying and you should love your stage manager because that stage manager is your friend in, in many, many ways. All right. There we go. Well, I'm off to a great start. Everybody's like, wow, she can't even do technology. Okay. Um, so as Lauren mentioned, I moved back to Cincinnati in 2006 and I had been stage managing in New York for nine years. And the role of a stage manager there was very defined. There were no, no ambiguity. Everybody knew what the stage manager did. Upon coming here, um, I did notice that there wasn't necessarily uh, the same sort of um, definition around a stage manager. So the role of the SM isn't necessarily very clearly defined, at least from what I have seen coming into uh, community theater here. Um, there's a huge variation amongst the groups with how they use a stage manager, when they use a stage manager. Um, and this is so evident by, you know, sometimes they'll call a person, an assistant director will do the things that a stage manager typically would do. Sometimes the producer does it. Um, they have other crew members uh, that, that do the role of the stage manager. One of the things that I, I did enjoy was they called it a rehearsal assistant. I have no idea what that means. Never heard that term, but it's funny to me. Um, and then, of course, there is a rehearsal stage manager versus a production stage manager. And I think that everyone thinks a stage manager, they know what a production stage manager does. I don't think they necessarily know what a rehearsal stage manager does. Because all of those other roles, those other people, the assistant director, the producer, another crew member, have typically done the things that a rehearsal stage manager would do. And one of the, I, I did enjoy, um, Lorraine had sent me what the Long Range Judging Committee had reached out to some of the theaters, asking, how do you use a stage manager? And there were, I think, seven groups that responded, and their answers were so varied, it, it just really hammered home the fact that I don't think there is a, a standard that people know what a state, what a stage manager does and what their role is. Um, and it also illustrated to me that the stage manager typically, at least from four out of the seven groups, they were coming in right before tech week. So there wasn't a stage manager present, or at least someone that they called a stage manager um, present for rehearsals. Um, and this lack of consistency, it makes it really hard. You don't know what your expectations are. The SM doesn't know what the expectations are. The group doesn't know what the expectations are. So that makes it really difficult. Um, makes it super difficult for the adjudicator too. 
So given this, how do you adjudicate a stage manager effectively and fairly? I don't know. Uh, this, is, this is really the thing that's been keeping me up at night, um, trying to think of how we answer this question. Um, no, no, really, how do you? It's complicated. And I'll be really upfront with you. I don't know that I can answer this question. I'm gonna try my best though, so uh, bear with me. Um, the role of the stage manager, so I did take this, I totally pirated this GIF or meme from, from the internet um, about what a stage manager is. And partially it's because it's funny and I did get a chuckle out of it. Um, but also I do think at the top left corner, this is what people don't understand. They don't understand what a stage manager is. And I think that's really much more prevalent than we would want to think it is. Um, and really, I also enjoyed the bottom right where it says what I actually do is herding cats. This is a true statement and the cats are rabid and feral. So, um, the role of the stage manager from my perspective. At its very core, the stage manager is that liaison between the cast and the production team, specifically the director and also the producer. So the stage manager is that connective tissue between the cast and the production team. The stage manager is the organizer, and I, I did kind of struggle with using this word, the disciplinarian of the cast, but again, um, you know, I have been called previously a drill sergeant. Um, I don't think it's, it's not wrong. Um, they are the, the organizer and disciplinarian of the cast, but they are also their advocate. And I feel like this is a very important thing to stress that the cast should be comfortable going to the stage manager with any sort of concerns they have. Uh, the stage manager is their advocate in terms of making sure that they are safe, literally safety of not causing them physical harm or that if they are uncomfortable in a situation. So that cast should feel free and comfortable to go to the stage manager and say, hey, I, I don't like this, this is uncomfortable to me, can you help? The stage manager then takes that information, goes to the director, goes to the producer. But there should be that trust um, between the cast and the stage manager uh, in order to advocate for that cast. And then finally, very important as well, the stage manager is also the director's partner. So they are literally hand in hand, every rehearsal facilitating communication with the production team coming out of rehearsals and also making sure that the director's vision for the show remains consistent during performances. So once the show opens, it's the stage manager's show. I know sometimes that we don't necessarily, um, that doesn't happen necessarily. A lot of times the directors will still come to shows. Um, I've actually had an, <laughs> the experience where a director continues to give notes literally on closing night. And I'm like, nope, nope, stage manager's show. This is stage manager's show. You, thank you, it's my show. So in an ideal world, um, what would a stage manager do? What would the responsibilities of a stage manager be? I know that this is ideal. Um, obviously we all don't work in an ideal world. Um, our groups vary, our venues vary. So, so this is truly, if, if we were in an ideal state, what would the responsibilities of a stage manager be? I'm gonna take it all the way to pre-production. So the stage manager can come in quite literally with auditions. So assisting auditions, checking people in, organizing the paperwork, bringing auditionees into the audition room, like all that kind of stuff, keeping things moving so that the director, the producer, and if there is a choreographer or a music director, vocal director, they can literally make sure that they focus on those auditionees, they don't have to worry about, you know, well, who's next? Where am I, are these bringing in? No, the stage manager handles all of those things. Once the show is cast, they create and distribute a cast and crew contact sheet. I know that sometimes we attribute that to the producer. Uh, that to me is a stage management duty, um, but I'll get to the blurred line there with producers. Create a rehearsal schedule with the director and distribute. Prepare 
the prompt book. And I was very specific about capital T, capital P, capital B. The prompt book is the Bible. Um, the prompt book is the most important thing uh, to a stage manager um, ever. Uh, I once had my car broken into and they stole my backpack. They thought probably I had something valuable, jokes on them. Uh, however, they stole my prompt book. It was my stage management uh, backpack and I was devastated. I was like, what am I, now what? Now what am I gonna do? I'm on my prompt book. And finally, uh, preparing the SM kit. So the SM kit can be as big or as little as you want it to be. At a minimum, you probably should have band-aids and aspirin, uh, tapes of various kinds, batteries, uh, scissors, safety pins, you name it. Um, I have seen quite literally like fishing tackle boxes of SM kits. I'm not, I'm not that, <laughs> not that much of a zealot, but I mean, the stage manager should be like the Boy Scout. You should always be prepared for anything and everything because quite frankly, anything and everything can and will happen. So moving on to rehearsal, this is very important to me. So lots of stuff that happens. Um, taping out the stage and the set, if you don't have the set at the facility. And again, this could be a lot of, a lot of groups don't have their own facility. So they will rehearse at a place that doesn't necessarily have their set. They have to build their set in six days, call it. So the stage manager should be coming in, taping out the set, taping out doors, taping out where the, the stairs should be, et cetera, so that the actors can see the dimensions, uh, makes blocking much easier for the director clearly. Um, sweeping the stage set prior to rehearsal. So this is super important too, making sure that everything is clean, uh, that there's nothing that is gonna cause injury or harm to the actors before rehearsal starts. Um, starting and ending rehearsals on time. So you are the timekeeper of, of the rehearsal. You're the timekeeper of the show. Um, this means calling an actor that's not in attendance or late or not excused. Um, I actually had an actor once tell me that he thought I hated him uh, because the very first rehearsal, he just was a no-show. And I said, well, you didn't show and I called you because you were nowhere to be found. And I said, once we got to a good place, I said, now, I said, now what? Do you think I don't like you now? And he's like, no. And I was like, well, it's business. Uh, if you don't show up to rehearsal, I'm going to call you and I'm going to call you and I'm going to be pretty stern about it. So the other thing is reminding actors what's going to be covered in that rehearsal. Um, managing and ensuring rehearsal breaks are taken. Again, this goes back to making sure that your cast is taken care of. Um, you know, rehearsal breaks are important and they give structure. And I think people don't necessarily give enough importance to the fact that people need and want structure. And so making sure you give rehearsal breaks, um, making sure that they're timed, making sure that they know how much time they have. Uh, it just makes people feel at ease. Um, and also I've had to have rehearsal breaks for when there was a heated moment between people. And I said, you know what, let's take 10 and you guys cool off and we'll come back. So the stage manager is super important for that very reason of making sure that just things are kept moving forward and in a positive manner. Um, recording bro blocking in the prompt book. Um, so everybody has their own shorthand in terms of recording blocking. I kind of do, you know, what I know as, you know, downstage right, cross here, there. Uh, but this is very, very important because, I mean, let's be clear. Do we all think that actors remember their blocking the first time that they get it from the director? Nope. You will be telling a an, an actor what their blocking is. I guarantee it. Uh, creating a prop, and a prop and costume list. So this is actually twofold. So making sure you keep a, a running list of uh, props in the costumes, but also recording a prop tracking plot and costume quick changes. So this is super important because if you've got props, you don't know how or where or when they're coming on, they're coming off, making sure you know this prop comes on with this person, it leaves with this person or it stays and it needs to be struck at intermission. Um, that's super important. Also costume quick changes, knowing if your actor has a quick change, that way, when you get to tech week, you're like, I need a dresser back there for this particular point. You need to be at this place. You need to be backstage, wherever. 
and you need to help so-and-so get their costume off. Sending rehearsal reports each night to the protection team with notes from the director. Super important. This goes back to you are the communication liaison between the director and rehearsal, what happens in rehearsal, to the rest of the production team. So the director should focus on directing the show. Your job as the stage manager is if the director is, is there and he's in the moment, he or she is in the moment and they say, you know what, I, I think I need a couple of blocks to give me some levels. You're typing it up, hey, set designer, we need some blocks. Or, you know, can I get a gobo here? Maybe I would like a, a gobo or a spotlight or, or something that is very specific. Lighting designer, can we do this? And those should go out that night or the next morning to the production team. It is the way to keep the production team in the know of decisions and or ideas that are being brought up at rehearsal uh, to the, from the director to the team. And that means that the producer doesn't actually have to be at rehearsal. How nice is that? Finally, be on, uh, excuse me, not finally, be on book when actors are off book and give lines when called for. Um, this is important because, you know, actors are going to call for line. They're going to skip lines. They're going to paraphrase lines. Um, I am very specific about how I give lines. And I actually, um, I have a separate script for just lines where I will make a notation of, did that actor call for line? Did he paraphrase it? Did they skip it? Um, and I use that same script over and over and over again because patterns will emerge. And so you'll be able to see, you know what? This person kept on calling for the same line over and over again. And I'll go back and I'll say to that actor, I'll say, you know what? You should probably take a look at this section. If they called for line once and they never call for it again, I, I'm not worried about that. That's, that's just something that they, eh, they had a bad night. They forgot it, it happens. Um, but it, you, you definitely see patterns emerge and it helps you pinpoint and focus that actor to tell them you really need to concentrate on this section, this section, and this section. And then giving line notes. So just what I said, except telling them, hey, you forgot this, you forgot this, you paraphrase this. Um, there it is. Uh, I'm including a sample rehearsal report here just to show it doesn't have to be the Magna Carta. You don't have to write down, like it, it can be as simple as like a couple of lines of here's what we did, here's who showed up um, and, and things that we need. And sometimes like, you know, this particular rehearsal, nothing was discussed for lighting. So, hey lighting, you don't, nothing really for you to see here. So, and these are, these are very, very helpful to the production team. Here's a sample props list and tracking plot, um, just to give you an idea of, and this was like early on of, okay, what's the, what's the prop? Where does it live? Who takes it on stage? Who takes it off stage? Notes, et cetera. That way that you have a, a good idea of where those, those props are coming from, where they live, because as we all know, <laughs> props tend to disappear, but that way you have a very clear uh, run of where that prop lives goes uh, after the show. Which brings us to responsibilities during tech week. And I feel like we all think that we're, we're maybe pretty clear about what an SM does during tech week. This is when, from what I have seen, most stage managers start to attend. So you do a dry tech with your design team and your tech team. So that is anything from light, sound, projections, all the things. You record all of these cues in the prompt book. Uh, you create a preset, a scene transition, an intermission list for your ASM and your backstage crew, who truly, in an ideal world, this is when they would be coming in. So they have no knowledge of the show. They're coming in and they are looking to you to tell them hey, here's all the things that need to happen. Here's, here's set pieces that need to move off. We've got a quick change here. We've got this here. So they are looking to you to tell them what needs to happen. You are the quarterback. They're coming in and they're like, what play are we running? Here it is. Set up props tables. 
begin calling said cues during tech runs and dress rehearsal. Running rehearsals with the assistant from, assistance from the design, the tech team, the director, et cetera. So, and then creating a sign-in sheet for actors, crew, orchestra, et cetera, whoever you have. Getting to the production. So it's opening night. Prepare for the show using a pre-show checklist. This can be doing a light, light cue check, sound check, any other special effect that you have. Making sure props are there, making sure the set is workable. Preparing the stage. This means sweeping and mopping, turning on work lights, etc. Checking the sign-in sheet for late or absent actors and calling them. Um, making sure you're giving call times to actors at various intervals. So I typically do an hour, 30, 15, 10, five places can be any sort of like intervals that you need, but, but yes, the actors always need to know when, what their time is. Coordinating with the house manager to open and then also closing the house. And then finally running the show itself. So this is calling all cues. Again, ideal world. I don't think that this is where we're at, but this would be calling cues to the light executioner, the sound person, uh, scenery. If if you are in a venue that where you have the ability or the the you know to fly in scenery, um, if you're using projections and maybe even actors. Although I have to say, in the twenty plus years that I've been stage managing, I have never once had to cue an actor to get on stage. You've called places, but never had to actually cue them to get on stage. And then calmly addressing any fires, floods, or other acts of gods during performances, because you will, you will have this happen. Every stage manager has a story. Everyone, if they don't, they are lying to you. It happens. All right, uh, here's a sample pre-show checklist and scene transition list. Again, looking at some of the things, I mean, you're doing, you're sweeping the stage, you're doing a dimmer check, you're doing a sound check, you're filling bottles and, and whatnot. Like you're, you are busy and it is all mapped out for you. That's, it's the stage manager makes things happen. But reality is we're not in an ideal state. The role of the SM within Cincinnati Community Theater I think that the line is blurred between the producer's role and the stage manager's role. And I think this is because producers in our community aren't really producers in the traditional sense. So a producer in a professional theater is the guy that puts the money up. Um, every time I've produced, I've never <laughs> put my own money up to fund a show. Um, I think that producers are a lot of times used to do traditional stage management duties. And I think Kristen is going to talk more about that um, after my presentation. So typically we are either the stage manager, stage manager comes in late, intermittent or no involvement with the rehearsal process. And I think that again goes back to there is a role that is blurred. There are people that are doing those responsibilities during the rehearsal process. We're just not calling them the stage manager. Um, but it is still a stage management duty. Um, Forrest said it, my next point, a lot of stage managers don't call cues to the crew members during performances. And this could be for a variety of reasons. Um, they couldn't have, maybe the venue doesn't have headsets. Um, there, or there's another lim venue limitation where, you know, you're not necessarily able to see uh, the stage or other blockers. Um, but more often than not, the stage manager is not the person that is calling the cues to anybody, which to me is a core responsibility of the stage manager, is they're the ones, the buck stops with them. If a cue doesn't get called, a cue technically shouldn't go. Um, and a lot of times here, a lot of stage managers have to execute cues themselves. I mean, let's be honest, there's not a lot of tech crew to go around. So we don't have the luxury of having, I mean, maybe some of us do, um, union, like uh, unlimited resources for union people to run lights and run sound and do that, this, that, and the other. 
a lot of times, and I've done it, I've run lights while I'm calling cues for sound, or I'm running sound while I'm calling cues for lights and projections. So stage managers kind of have to fill in the gaps where you don't have um, somebody to actually do that. So that's a tricky situation too. Um, and then what I have noticed is that we're very transactional. So what I've seen is that people expect the stage manager to just kind of be like, hey, it's tech week, sweet, let's call some cues, sweet, versus being the continuity from auditions to strike. And that to me is a huge disparity between what a stage manager should be doing versus how we're using a stage manager here in the community. So what are the observables for an SM? Great question. This is tricky. It's also why you're here, because you haven't really come here to listen to me blather on and on. There are so many things that a stage manager does that are unseen to the audience and the adjudicators. It is just the nature of what we do. You know, Chad and Forrest were able to tell you, like, you know, look for this and, you know, notice this. And, and you know, there are actual things to look for. We don't have that as, as part of a stage manager's duties is it's managing people um, and making sure that things run smoothly. Um, that's hard to to kind of quantify and, and see that and specifically say that that's something that the stage manager did. There are also a lot of things that are attributed to the stage manager that they might not even be doing. Um, I think one of the observables that, that we have for a stage manager is we're all the cues called and timely. And we literally just heard that oh, <laughs> Forrest in the five years he's been doing stuff has never had a cue called to him. So <laughs> what do you do with that? How, how, do we, how do we normalize this role? Um, I don't know. It's, I'm telling you, I have like toiled, literally toiled about this um, for, for weeks. Um, what's the answer? Uh, so here's my suggestion. And take it as one woman's suggestion. I feel like we need a community-wide level set. And this starts first and foremost with broad education about what an SM is and what they do. Um, I think we could also stand to use a standardization of forms and templates across all groups. That's an easy, easy thing. So we can basically put together a packet for everyone to use and say, here's all the examples of the paperwork that a, that a stage manager can use. Here you go, use them. And that way people can realize like, oh, these are tools that I can use to, to help run the show. Nomenclature, call the person that does the SM duties, the SM. So the, the biggest aha moment I had from when Lorraine sent me this information was, there are people that are doing some, not all, but some of the duties of the stage manager during the rehearsal process. We're just not calling them the stage manager. And I don't know why. Um, and it's okay if that person is the producer, but call them the producer and the rehearsal stage manager, because we have to get to a point where we are, are giving credence to the fact that there is such a thing as a stage manager that needs to be there during the rehearsal process. These are the roles and responsibilities of what an SM does. By assuming that an SM's job starts with tech week, you're discounting all of the things that an SM does previous to that. And so call the person that does all the things, if they're on book, if they're taking blocking notes, those are stage management duties, call them that. Don't call them the producer and say, well, our producer does that. Nope, oh, okay, then it's the producer and it's the rehearsal stage manager. The rehearsal assistant, call them the stage manager. I feel like the rehearsal assistant is like the, the wannabe stage manager, but you're really doing the thing, you're doing the thing. Um, and then I, I hope I'm, I'm not stepping on toes to suggest this, but offer trainings or a boot camp to current up and coming and future stage managers. Um, I don't know if ACT would be open to this. I'm, I'm happy to help, but um, I hope I'm not causing agita to, <laughs> to Dan and Lorraine and Amanda. Uh, 
Oh, goodness. Um, really, truly, I, I'm, I am avoiding the question because I don't, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the best way, I think, to address what a lot of the judges are concerned about is how am I able to properly give credit to a stage manager and to assess that's what they do. Um, my suggestion would be you have to ask pertinent questions of the producing group because there is no way to know what a stage manager does without asking these questions. Because again, if you're looking at observables of where the cues called on time, you don't even know if the stage manager is calling the cues. So here's my suggestions. When did that SM join the production? Did they join? Were they part of the rehearsal process? Did they just come in for tech? Um, did the cast seem well rehearsed? Because to me, that is the sign of a good stage manager if they seemed well rehearsed. Could be a director too. Again, line blurred. Does the facility have the ability to communicate backstage to the crew, to the actors, to the house? A lot of our facilities, I know, they don't. I mean, we are literally working with, with the exception, of course, with CMT that, you know, has the luxury of being at the Aronoff. I mean, there are facilities within our groups. They were old churches. They're, they're, they're schools, old bowling alleys. I mean, we, we do amazing things in the facilities that, we, that we're in, um, but they're not conducive to a, a real, I can say real, real theater. Um, if they do, does the stage manager call cues? Do they utilize these methods of communication? Did the SM execute cues? So that's something to consider because it's very different calling a cue, just being like, yeah, I'm just going to sit back. I'm going to let you guys do this versus I'm executing a cue. And then I'm also telling you, hey, stand by for sound cue two. There's a timing involved with that. Um, and then what other facility characteristics are present that need to be considered? So again, we have such a varied, um, varied um, facilities within our group. And, you know, maybe there aren't a lot of, of lights there. Maybe there, there's, there's limitations to um, what can be done at this facility that, that probably bears noting. So again, current SM observables, did the overall show run smoothly? Did show intermission start on time? Again, um, I mean, sometimes things happen beyond your control. Um, acts of God, et cetera. Um, were all cues executed on time? And again, how can you observe this when the SM doesn't necessarily call the cues? Were set changes done smoothly and quickly? Again, if the stage manager isn't able to communicate with their backstage crew, should that be attributed to the SM? Should it be attributed to the backstage crew? Should, if a sound cue is off, should that be attributed to the stage manager? I don't know. These are my thoughts. <laughs> and so I, I, I really, unfortunately, hate to kind of be so ambigu ambiguous, um, but it is, it's to me a very squishy um, role and it's a squishy topic of how do we, how do we sort of normalize and educate people on what a stage manager does. So with that, I'll oh, love the questions. I hated every minute of <laughs> well, we have some, and talking. Mary. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. That was, I mean, actually it was really, as a director in community theater, it was really refreshing to listen to you speak about the role of the stage manager because that is something that we deeply want as directors um, in, in our area. So I really hope groups are listening to your suggestions because that was great. I also wonder if you're for hire for a personal life needs. <laughs> hire you to be my personal stage manager. Just curious. I, I love <laughs> stage managing people. I love, I love <laughs> telling people what to do. Oh, yeah. you go here. So one thing that um, you mentioned in your in your presentation was um, reaching out to the groups and asking these questions. And I want to reiterate to the adjudicators that that is an excellent suggestion by Mary. And in, in Act Cincinnati, we have judging assistants that are assigned to each of our groups um, based on who who um, 
who's being adjudicated during the season. Um, I'm a judging assistant. Mary has has been a judging assistant, and I think she still is. So when you're assigned a judging assistant, we set we schedule you for your judging. It would be a perfect opportunity at that time to send those list of questions to your judging assistant and say, can you reach out to the uh, theater and ask them these questions? Um, and as an assistant, we would reach out to their contact and we could let you know, okay, here's how they're approaching the role of stage manager with this group. Um, and I and I think that will really help with writing um, your adjudication. I have actually done that before as an adjudicator because my experience lies with Footlighters and with um, Society Music Theater. And even those two theaters have completely different stage manager jobs. So um, do not be afraid to utilize your judging assistants as a, as a means of asking these great questions that Mary posed um, in her presentation today. So, And I'm gonna jump on what Amanda just said and say that this is one of the things that the Long Range Judging Committee was looking at. You are kind of like, you poor little guinea pig, the start of getting this conversation going. With Ben going back to, we do have the website and we've asked our theaters to answer questions about lighting and sound and their venue. And we're going to hopefully continue to ask them to give us answers about how do you use your stage manager generally? And if that's gonna change for this show, well, get up there and tell us so we can change it. So an adjudicator can go to the website and look at that theater and have those questions generally answered, hoping to help them respond in the areas that gray over like stage management and producer and director and where are those three people for your group and even for your show um, where they are. So Amanda, do we have some questions from the folks? Yeah, we got some great questions actually. Good. So Beth C says, uh, can Mary speak, speak to the groups who require cast attendance at set building or paint calls and whether monitoring participation is the stage manager's duty? And if so, how do you encourage and ensure participation? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> so this goes back to, um, and tr great question, Betsy. Um, that's a, an area that is blurred. I would think that, um, you know, participation in set builds, et cetera, that kind of, to me, goes to each individual group. So a lot of groups have a, a set crew um, and they don't really need uh, actors to come in, et cetera, et cetera. So um, as a stage manager, I wouldn't necessarily be responsible for going in and saying, hey, guys, hey, you need, we need you on X, Y, Z Saturdays. Um, however, if there was a if there was a set build um, um, day, I don't know that I, as the stage manager, would necessarily have the authority to say, hey, you didn't show up. Um, again, I feel like that goes to the group that goes back to the producer and potentially the board of directors for that particular group to say, hey, we got, you know, we had X amount of participation. These people never showed up to a, a set build. Um, I don't know if you want to consider casting them in the future if they didn't put in the time. Because, again, this is all volunteer. We're community theater. Nobody's getting paid to do anything here. Um, you, you're, you're basically getting cast and it's, it's all in. So everybody has to pitch in and, and do some work that, that maybe not necessarily it's, it's on stage work. Um, but I would put that to the group necessarily versus the stage manager. Great. I love that. Um, so we got another great question from Mark. Mark says in your experience, who has the responsibility for designing the transitions between the scenes and sets? Is that a stage manager or a director job? So in my, thanks Mark, awesome question. Um, what I, I think ultimately for the stage manager and the backstage crew, the objectives are a little bit different than a director's objectives. So the stage manager's objectives are gonna be make, do that scene change, as quietly, as quickly, and as safely as possible. Um, the director might wanna have sort of a vision where they're like, well, I really want this to move here. Um, but I think there's, it's a collaboration, truly. But ultimately, um, the responsibility of doing that, that set change and set design, and any sort of transition is on the stage manager and it's also on the ASM and the backstage crew. Did that answer that question, Mark? Did I answer that? Okay. <laughs> I think that was a great answer. Um, we have another question. 
So Peter um, asks, what advice do you give to directors on how to best utilize their stage managers? Basically, what should directors let go of and what should they not delegate? Oh, Peter, what a great question. Um, directors need to let things go. Your stage manager is going to take good care of you. Truly, stop worrying. Learn to love your stage manager. Let them do all of the administrative things like you should be as a director, truly immersing yourself in the vision that you have of your show. So you should be concerned about is are your actors giving the characterization that you want? Are you seeing pictures, stage pictures, blocking, et cetera? Are you telling the story of how you want to tell it? You should not be sweating whether or not, like, I, I you know, um, did so-and-so turn in their membership form? Like, that's on the stage manager. So learn to let go. And truly, like, I think, because I've worked with a director who never had worked with a stage manager before, at least a rehearsal stage manager. And this person, when the actor was calling for a line, literally was giving the line to them. And I was like, no, no, that's me. You need to, you, you focus on you. Let me do that. And slowly, 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 this person let go and came to me afterwards and was like, I could get used to this. I could definitely get used to having somebody um, take that burden off of me. And I just, I, it's, it's amazing to me that we don't utilize more stage managers and, and that we don't kind of lift that burden off of our directors and our producers too. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> Um, Greg, I got, I got a couple more here. Um, so Greg says, Hey, large cast musicals, stage managers are seen as uh, cat herders, as you mentioned, which by the way, I literally spit my water out when you referred to us as feral. Cat. Feral and rabbit. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then he goes on to mention small cast drama. People feel that maybe the stage manager isn't doing as much. Are small casts, uh, stage managers being under recognized by us as adjudicators? Hmm. Um, I would argue that um, any cast, there is always cat herding. Always, always, always. There is, it doesn't, just because it's a bigger group of cats doesn't mean that you're still not herding the cats. And it doesn't mean that they're not all rabbit and feral either, because they are. So I would say that it is just as much work uh, with a small maybe even a straight play cast stage managing that group of people as it would be a bigger musical. The bigger musicals are more complex just because you've got um, a bigger cast and you've got probably more moving parts. So you've got choreography, you've got um, music, you've got all those types of things. They typically are bigger sets, bigger costumes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you still put in the same amount of effort. Believe you me, you put in the same amount of effort in a, a small straight play that you would a big musical. Um, you're maybe not putting as much upfront time as you would with a straight play. Um, but again, stage managers don't necessarily have to be at choreography rehearsals or vocal rehearsals. But again, that rehearsal process is much longer than a straight play. A straight play, you can rehearse in five, six weeks. Musicals take months, you know, literal months. So um, no, I, I would say, you. I would say we put in just as much effort with a small straight play as, as a musical. But thank, yes, great question, Greg. Great, and the last thing that, there's no other questions, but the last thing that I wanna point out uh, for anybody who's following along, Fred Hunt, uh, the second vice president for Act Cincinnati has put into the comment thread the um, judging assistants that are assigned to each group. So if you are curious to know which group um, and who is the judging assistant for that group. He has put that information in the comments section, um, which is also available on our webpage, which you could go to at any time, actcincinnati.org, and um, receive a lot of this information um, to hopefully help you in your adjudicating travels. <laughs> so thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you again for having me. I hope I was helpful. Um, and again, love to start the conversation. Would love to continue the conversation. We've got a long road ahead of us, but it's such an important role. Yeah, I think that um, maybe this is the first step of the boot camp, uh, this presentation today. And it's something that, uh, I, I mean, I know my term at ACT is coming to an end, but it might be something that, that the next administration could, could look towards doing, uh, possibly a summer boot camp or, or something of that nature. And we'd love to have you involved 
with that for sure. Um, I'm because we, we just need more people trained as stage managers. We just don't have, uh, I think a lot of it is just, we don't have enough people. Uh, I think you'd be surprised based on what I read. I think there are people that are doing the job, but we're just not calling it a stage manager's job. Um, and I, I, I really think that we need to start calling it um, the person that's at rehearsal that's taking notes, call that person a stage manager. And I think you'll find once we start doing that, um, that people will be like, oh, okay, but that's, that's what a stage manager does. I think it's just such, it's so shrouded in mystery, <laughs> it's an enigma, um, people don't know. Well, thank you so very much, Mary. We are very, very appreciative. And we're going to go to our final presentation. I'm going to introduce that next person. Our final presenter hails from Columbus, Ohio, but we're, we're promised not to hold that against her. Kristen Vicente is a graduate of Ball State University, and she has a degree in theatrical studies and anthropology, and she received her project management certificate in 2019. So she's well into the producing, even if she's not on stage. Kristen has taken on a variety of roles in Cincinnati Community Theater. She's done costuming, she's been a dramaturg, she's a stage manager, set painter, actor, and the reason we called her in, she's producer. She's worked with Marymont and Beachmont, and Beachmont was the first theater group to rope her in. And she has projects in the wings for Village Players and Footlighters when we get the chance to be live once again. Kristen has worked at the Cincinnati Art Museum for the past seven years, and she wants us all to know that she's very grateful for the amazing community theater family that has welcomed her with open arms. That's us. She lives in Bond Hill with her fiance, Ryan, who is also involved in community theater, and he supports her, all her endeavors in that realm. And um, he'd have to for sure when she takes on producing. So we're very grateful to have Kristen present What's This Producer Doing Here Anyway? The role and responsibilities of being in a producer. Kristen Hunt, take it away. Thank you so much, Laureen. Um, hello, everyone. How's it going? Um, it's lovely to see all of you on this lovely sunny day. I'm just like continually glancing out my window. Um, thank you all so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. And thank you to all the other presenters. It's been such a fun filled day to watch everyone. And I don't know how I'm supposed to follow Mary exactly. Um, but I will do my darndest. Um, but uh, yeah, I just much like Mary's presentation, I really wanted to start i feel like the the role of the producer is something that not a lot of people talk about and i know that um when i first got asked to be a producer by jerry i had to look up what i was doing i had no idea um and just like mary kind of alluded to you know there is a lot of talk of most of the information that you find about producers online is talking about like working in hollywood and uh putting all your money forward and you know i making Pirates of the Caribbean movies and stuff like that. And that's definitely not what we're doing um, in community theater. So um, just to get started, what is a producer? Um, so I found a great article um, on americantheater.org and they talk about all the different things that a producer is. And rightly, they said that um, a producer is many things to many people and they have deep and difficult conversations with many stakeholders, which I think is true. And one of the quotes from Al Hartley, uh, Al Hartley, sorry, um, who is currently managing director of the Virginia Wadsworth Wirtz Center for the Performing Arts at Northwestern University said, you may have the impression as I did that producers are simply organizers or project managers, but that flattens the role's dimensions. Producers carry not only the skills of effective organizers, but also the instincts of practicing artists. And I think that's really true. Um, I think that the strongest points um, that has really helped me to be a good producer has been that since I have that theatrical studies degree, I have worked in lighting, I have worked in sound, you know, I can talk the talk with the techies and I can also, you know, have the emotional breakdown with the actors at the same time, right? You can juggle all of those things at one time and you have to be able to wear all those hats and, and feel everybody's pain. So, um, so I just wanted to go over some of the things of what a producer is. So, this is very general and I'm going to go through it really quickly. Um, producer's responsibility generally, um, budget oversight, organizing and finding the production team. This is the obnoxious list of random things that I could throw at a wall. We'll go through more of these um, later, but this is just the beginning. Not every show has every one of these positions either. So it's all a big toss up. Um, you coordinate meetings, you're coordinating auditions, you're coordinating parties, which is the fun part. Um, you want to communicate 
with the board of trustees, the production team, the actors, you are the person in the middle of all of that, making sure that's hap happening. You are the calming voice in the room. Um, and you're the person who will most likely get blamed for everything at the end of the day, um, which could cause your head to explode. Definitely, definitely could cause your head to explode. That is a lot, that is a lot. So that's why we're here to kind of talk through what all of these steps are. So where should we, begin. Well, before we begin, I felt that we needed to set some ground rules, some things that I am assuming that you all know, and because assuming is never a good thing, um, I'm going to say these things out loud so that we all, I am assuming that we all know these things as we go through and as I talk about all the things that a producer does. So first things first, when you are the producer, who is your best friend? Is it Tom from your fantasy football league? Is it Cindy from high school? Is it your mom? Is it your neighbor? No, it definitely is not. It is your director. Your director is your best friend. While I'm going through all of this, I won't mention the director a lot because I am assuming that you know that you are the right hand of the director, right? Everything that you are doing, you are doing for them. Um, you are doing to help with the production and you are realizing their vision. You are not the director. You are the producer and you are helping them. So that is that is how you are moving through. Um, some big rules to follow as you go through being a producer, never assume anything ever, ever, because the minute that you assume that your rehearsal space is open on a Tuesday, it's rented for a birthday party, surprisingly, and you had no idea. Um, the minute that you assume that everyone texts, multiple people only have flip phones and don't use Gmail, so you have to call them. Never assume, em assume anything. Um, plan as much as possible. Things will always go wrong, right? But as much as you can, try to plan ahead. Something will happen, something will pop up, but be sure to try to plan as much as you can. Laugh through it because Something like I said, something's gonna go wrong and you might as well laugh through it. And just remember, it's gonna be great. At the end of the day, the show will open. You will hand it over to your amazing stage manager that we're all hoping is exactly like Mary. You will hand it over to them and then it will be done and it will be great. And all of those horrible random things that happened uh, will be a distant memory. And then I just had to share this gif. Uh, this is the gif that Jerry and I sent back and forth the entire time that I have been a producer. We just send this all the time. And I think that it is true of the entire process. That's This is what you're doing and you just laugh through it and this is fine. Everything's on fire around you and it's fine. Um, okay, so at the beginning, you're planning, right? Obviously you're trying to plan everything out. Um, and I wanted to share with you guys, hopefully it switches over. Oh, I'm getting the little spinny wheel of thought death. It's thinking about it. Um, but I wanted to share that Marimont has a really great, oh, it all closed. That's sad. <laughs> um, Marimont has a really great production list that goes over all the things for producers. Um, and once I pull that up, let me see if it'll let me share again and be less sad um, because it's way better to see it. Here we if go. If it helps at all, Kristen, you're still showing your screen. So you are, once you pull, oh, there you go. You're good. Hey, there it goes. Let's think about it. I don't know why. Maybe I put too many gifts. It's telling me I can't have this many is the problem, I'm sure. All right. Let's go through this again. Ooh, speed round. Here we go. Okay. Um, okay, we're back. Oh, I just skipped over it. There it is. This is what I'm trying to show. So Marimont makes this amazing production checklist, which is really, really great. And I haven't seen any other community theaters that have really outlined it this well about the all of the different steps and the order in which you should do them in. Um, much like Mary talked about, and I want to talk about it later, every community theater is different in their expectations of what a producer does. But in general, this is a really great layout of all the things and the timing in which you should do them, um, which I think is really, really important. And there's a lot of things in here that I think a lot of people forget about or think that maybe that can just happen later. But this is a really good layout for when you want those things to happen. Um, and Marimont has this and I'm happy to share with anyone that would like it. But it's it's definitely very, very helpful. Um, okay, so what does that whole list of craziness mean? It means lots and lots of emails, lots of emails. You're going to get very good at emails. Um, I personally suggest that if you don't have a Gmail account, it's very good. It's very easy and it's free. Definitely have a Gmail account and check it very regularly. Unfortunately, if you've ever worked with me, I will suddenly like all of a sudden I'll send 20 emails in one hour and then I won't respond for two hours and then I'll send 20 emails again. So, but you will send a bunch of emails and never, like I said, never assume that somebody knows something. It's better to send an email and say, 
rehearsal is starting 15 minutes late or just wanted to make sure that you're good with this. So put it all in an email. So um, we're gonna go over the general order, order of requests that everybody that you need to put out. Um, and then we'll go into more detail with each of these. So general order of requests per what that Marymont list was, you're probably gonna start with your production team. Um, after the director has secured the producer, which now is you, um, I personally would say that the stage manager is the most important. Um, for me, it's always been really successful when a stage manager is involved in the rehearsal process. Um, and so having that stage manager there is really, really important. Um, then you've got the set designer because that's one of the first things you're gonna wanna share with everyone is what does the set look like? And the rest of your production team is gonna have to have that. So you wanna make sure that you get that um, together. And then you've got your other production staff and team, which like I said, there was that whole vomitous list. You won't need Sometimes you need a dialect coach, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you need a projection person, sometimes you don't. So you'll just have to figure out with your director exactly what they want for everything. Um, and then once you think you have everything, you'll have a second round of the production team you forgot. People that you didn't realize that you would need, you know, like set decor person. You did the set designing, but you didn't do set decor. So you're gonna go back and then you're gonna wanna replace those who have declined um, to do those with you. And then you're gonna wanna set up a production meeting. Very important, very, very important. Um, you want to have that set design finalized, um, and I would definitely encourage to keep the board involved throughout. Invite, uh, Marimont has a really good, it organized really well that there is someone who is in charge of production and you should be inviting them to be there so that they can report back to the board. It's always great to keep that line of communication open consistently, um, so you want to be sure to do that. And then these are all the rest of the things that will fall um, into place. So like I said, each of these big bullet points, I think I have a thing, each of these big bullet points, we're gonna hit those really quickly. I'm gonna give you some little tips and tricks that I've learned from each one. Um, and I really like gifts, so there's probably gonna be gifts in here somewhere. <laughs> All right, so first things first, the production team. The production team is so important and makes up so much of everything that you do for this show. It's the biggest responsibility of a producer to secure the production team. Um, so it's, it's a big chunk of what you do. Again, this is a list of production team roles that I could find. Footlighters also had a list of um, for producers who you should request or sh should have. So this is the beginning of that list. Not all of these you will use every time. You know, vocal direction, if you're not doing a musical, you won't use it. Um, all of a dance captain, similar, music direction, all of that stuff. Um, so this is just a good set um, standard of the things that you will work on and people you will work on to work with. Um, I know for me, I mean, I know lots of people, but I don't know everyone. So you definitely wanna lean on your board. You wanna lean on your director um, and just offer to send those emails, emails, emails to everyone. Um, and then production team meetings are also very, very important. Um, you wanna request to be able to email everyone, um, or sorry, the request email that you send to everyone to ask them to be on your production team. You. I always think it's best to start strong and provide important dates. You know, opening night is this night. Um, we are gonna do photos on this night. Uh, all of this, if you have those dates, which you probably do, share those at the beginning. Send the script and definitely offer, I mean, COVID is weird, but still offer for a Zoom meeting or coffee or something um, to sit down and discuss all the responsibilities that you want. Then you're gonna wanna have a full production meeting and definitely bring that set design there so that everyone can be on the same page. Um, and invite everyone to mingle and get to know each other. Everyone's gonna start going off on their silos. It's good for everyone to know and for you to be the conduit that everyone can communicate with each other. And then emails, 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 keep sending those emails. Smaller group meetings if necessary, if people need to talk to each other. It's always really good to encourage cross communication between everyone. Um, definitely invite your production team to the cast party and to strike. You want to make sure that they feel included. Def, def, fo, show. All right, some helpful tips for the production team that I have learned. You're CCing your director on all emails. Again, you are the right hand um, of God. So you are keeping your director involved in all communication from the beginning. You are not doing anything without them knowing you want them to be in on that communication. Will they read every email you send? Probably not, but at least you, they were on there so that they can 
they can save you one or um, they can see how that communication went down. Always, always, always empower your production team. You are the producer, you're helping set these people up. So you want to make sure that you are empowering your production team, supporting them and really, you know, in meetings saying, I think that you can do that, I believe in you. Um, I have found it the most helpful to always share contact information with everyone. Again, if you set up a Gmail, a Google Drive comes with that, which is amazing. And this is an example, I'm not trying to share everybody's cell phone numbers, I apologize. But um, this is an example of a really good list that I keep in a Google Drive that is in a public place that I have sent everyone. That again, em empowers the production team that if Ryan wants to call Eric Bardis, he doesn't have to talk to me, I can say, the contact information is there. Feel free to reach out whenever you'd like. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, lean on your director and board with helping find individuals. This is a lot of people. Running crew is a big thing. Um, all of those things are very important and you there are lots of people to help you. And then fun tip that I have found, leave for last what you are um, most confident in. I can do costumes if I have to. I probably couldn't do lighting if I had to. So I'm gonna find a lighting designer and a sound designer first because if everything falls out and costumes have to happen, you're probably gonna do it as the producer, right? You're the one who can run around behind the scenes. Um, and we'll talk more about that later as far as adjudicating. If I feel like if a producer is all of the production assignments in the program, then they weren't really a good producer because you're supposed to be finding people and not just picking up all the slack, right? Um, so yeah, production team. Woohoo. Then we go to auditions. Fun, fun, fun. Um, so here's kind of before, day of, and after good things that um, I have used. Uh, definitely a you're going to want to touch base with each location that you're at. Every location has a different standard of how they post auditions, where they post auditions, how quickly they want auditions done. Some locations will really just allow you to do it whenever you want. I know that directors have lots of opinions on when you want to audition people to make sure that you get the right people for your show. So lots of that. But in general, um, lean on the board, share your audition dates early and widely, try to get those on the calendar so you can get as many people. Um, I've created Sign Up Geniuses before, so we'll see if this works. But in general, I'm sure you all have seen a Sign Up Genius. It's the easiest thing um, to really organize everyone. You can send emails through it. It makes you get all that information. I think this is from Broadway Bound, so it's probably really dead now. <laughs> um, and then provide multiple dates. You definitely don't want to just have one evening where, you know, then you're only inviting your best friends. You want to allow for a lot of people to come. Create an audition form and a tip, definitely try to get a volunteer. As the producer, you think that you can be everywhere all the time and you can't. Um, chances are good that you're going to be in the audition room. You're going to want someone to welcome the auditionees as they come in to hand out forms. Everybody's anxious, you know, just someone to calm the room. Um, Mary Kay Wiesenhan, whenever I've been producer for Jerry, has always been that volunteer and she's the best. Um, okay, and then day of confirm um, who's coming and who's your volunteer, print the sides, um, and definitely have an audition form. And then after, finalize the cast list, call um, the confirmed cast. Pro tip, if you're calling for someone to offer a part to someone, do not offer them that part over a voicemail. Ask them to call you back and tell them that they have that part so that you guys can speak one to, you know, person to person, depending on how everything moves around. You know, you definitely don't want that just sitting on their voicemail. You want to talk to them about it. Plus, I've had literally, it's the most exciting to call someone and tell them they have the role and they like scream in your ear and are so excited. So you don't want to miss that by leaving it in a voicemail. Um, and then once the cast list is confirmed, you want to email every person who auditioned and tell them that they have not made it and thank them for their time. It's so important that they don't find out that they didn't make it through a cast list being posted, that they find out from you and you thank them for your time. And then be sure to share that cast list widely. Again, lean on your board. They'll probably have an opinion on how they would like that done. Um, some helpful tips that I have found, this again is pending your director and how much that director wants you involved um, and your insights. Try to encourage to not keep everyone all night. I mean, the director has a million people in their heads. They're trying to do all of these things. If a person's been sitting there for a while, maybe casually look to the director and be like, Dan hasn't read in a while. Do you think we could let Dan go? And they'll probably say yes. Um, and then try to keep track of what everyone has read for. So if Amanda has read 
you know, for two of the four women's roles, but and she keeps reading for those again and again and again, um, then maybe go to the director and say, you know, she could be of all four, maybe see if we can switch it around. Um, because remember, like in the next point, everyone is anxious. They want to showcase themselves. The director is moving a million pieces in their mind and trying to get all of these things together. And you can be the one that's like, you know, Amanda really wanted to read for female role three, but you've only had to read for one and two. Why don't maybe we just throw it in there? I know you're not thinking about her for number three, but she's thinking about her for number three. So maybe just read it for her. Um, again, do not offer a role over a voicemail. And remember that auditions, it just kind of seems like it's set up time. But again, don't assume anything. I have walked in and people have been constructing a set when I thought we were doing auditions on that stage. You know what I mean? There's going to be set up time. It's always better to be there, confirm everything, move tables around, all that stuff. All right. Then we move into rehearsals. This is kind of when you've done a lot, right? You've you've gotten all the people together. Your production team is set. You've done auditions. Everything is good. So I just really have some helpful tips, really, for after you get through rehearsals or two rehearsals. Um, helpful tips for rehearsals. As a producer, you should attend at minimum one rehearsal a week. Um, if you have a stage manager, that stage manager probably, I would assume I would request that that stage manager be at every rehearsal. They're the person who's going to be um, off book or on book when the uh, when the actors are off book, all of that good stuff. So you should be there once a week. I have also found personally that you can say a million times, you know, you can text me, you can call me, you can email me, send up a flare and they still won't. But somehow if you're there once a week, someone will corner you and be like, by the way, I'm feeling really uncomfortable with this and I'm, I'm really worried about this. And they'll tell you to your face, but they won't send an email. So it's always good to just be around. Um, try to encourage for rehearsal set up to the director, try to encourage only inviting those that are needed um, to the rehearsals. So this calendar here is one that um, Jerry's made for, I think this was Broadway bound again. Um, and you can see all the red ones are, Peggy was a smaller role. She only came on certain days and we made sure to orchestrate that with her and she knew that. So it's good to only call people that are needed and you can be a conduit to, to kind of help support that conversation. And your SM probably will also say, hey, the actors are all saying that they're just sitting in the back and not rehearsing. Could we change up who we're calling? Um, definitely invite production team to come to rehearsals and share this schedule widely in that Google Drive. Um, again, costumers have to measure people, lighting designers, it's great to see how things are moving. Tell them when you're rehearsing and what you're rehearsing, and it's always good to keep that line of communication open. Um, be mindful of holidays. You can see on here, I think, yeah, Rosh Hashanah is on here. You wanna be mindful of what people are doing and where they're trying to go, long weekends, things like that. You wanna try to help encourage that. Um, and then don't uh, it, be sure to introduce the stage manager. That's such an important thing and keep the stage manager as that conduit between your production team, the actors and all that good stuff. And then don't forget about the program. In the middle of all of this, you're doing a program and don't forget to do that. Um, okay. Now we're moving on to tech week. Keep calm and tech week is gonna be great. All right, again, you've gotten all the way to tech week. These are just some helpful tips that I have. Um, of course, as everyone has seen, sorry, I can't, it's tech week. At this point, because of COVID, I'm like longing for a tech week and telling people I'm too busy <laughs> to do something. Um, but once we get back, um, some helpful tips for tech week. You should definitely plan as a producer to be there every evening. Again, something is going to go wrong and you should be there. From my experience, the beginning of the week, right, is kind of worse. Um, by the end of the week, everybody's getting into the flow. And that's when you can kind of come in and out and do other things because you're going to you're going to be doing a million things. So I have come in, checking in the beginning and then something's missing and I'm the one who goes and runs out and buys overalls at Walmart or something like that's what you're doing. Um, be sure you've planned a firm date for promo photos. You have to share that date with your production team. You want your promo photos to be as done as possible. Um, so be sure that you have that date and it's shared widely. If that's final dress, then everybody should be comfortable that promo photos are happening that day um, and be sure to work with everyone. Um, try not to volunteer to help. I know that this sounds very opposite to everything that we've talked about, but if you volunteer to help, 
to do something in tech week, chances are good you will be doing it the whole run of the show, right? So you, again, this goes back to empowering everyone to do what you know that they can do and what just supporting them. Um, now on the flip side, right? Be sure to volunteer to help. If the stage manager is freaking out, how can I help? Do you need me to run it for a minute? Do you need 10 minutes? Can I do something? But if you offer, oh, just for tonight, I'm going to run the props table. Chances are good that they will depend on you. And then you will run the prop table every night. Be sure once you volunteer, you're ready to be there for the full run of the show. Um, be sure to encourage breaks. I know Mary talked about this. Breaks are an amazing thing. Walk away for 10 minutes. You know, a Q to Q is so exhausting for everyone and you're all in your head. Um, so always encourage breaks. Um, be sure to find people to attend the final dress. This is something that, again, the director will probably forget. Um, invite the production team. They'll probably never see the show otherwise. Um, invite significant others. Invite the board of trustees. Again, I keep going back to Marymount. I think, Dan, correct me, is it a, a retirement community, right? Yeah, we've had a retirement community come uh, on occasion to performances. Yeah. And it's really good. The production team gets to see how it's operating in there. And then the actors have been so anxious and leading up to this moment and they get to hear laughs and stuff. And that's something that you should definitely, if you can, try to do. And then just remember as you head into Tech Week, something's going to explode. Something's going to go wrong. Try to know that you have planned well and feel confident. Um, and then we get to the run of the show, which is exciting. So exciting. It's the stage manager's job now. It's going to be great. You're going to be great. Here's just some helpful tips as we go into it. Um, as Mary alluded to, this is a performance report. I have known so few stage managers that have done them. I would really require, I, I feel like it should be a requirement. It's just so helpful to keep that information public to the production team and make sure that that communication is happening. So performance reports, performance reports, performance reports. Um, as a producer with the director, right, be sure to advocate for the stage manager. You have handed this off to them now. This is their baby. They're running it. You have done all the work. So be sure to advocate for them. Talk to them regularly. Ask them how you can help. I think I had a stage manager one time. I mean, we knew going into it, they had a wedding for a family member they wanted to go to, obviously. So I came in and was SM for one night, right? I mean, those are things that you can do to be supportive. Um, be sure to sit, share this performance stop by with the director. I mean, someone should be at every show, the director or you, to stop in, see how everyone's doing, um, and be sure to share that with your director and be there regularly. Um, be sure to organize meals if you need to. And then try to keep on celebrations for the end. Because again, everybody's pulled a million different ways. That opening weekend, everyone's exhausted, right? After tech week. Um, so you've got the cast party, you've got awards, you've got gifts, and then you need to plan strike. So here we are. We made it all the way to strike. So good. And this is how you're feeling at once strike happens. It's so exciting. You're there. <laughs> Just throw the ring into the Mount Doom and it's going to be great. Um, really quick, helpful tips for strike. And we'll see if this, um, oh no, that's that one. We'll see if this loads, maybe if I can click on it. There we go. Um, I have only found a few people who have created strike assignments. I find them really, really helpful because everyone is running around in a million different directions. So I think you guys can see this. I might be able to zoom in. I don't know. Oh, there we go. Um, so these are just some general strike um, assignments. I find it really, really helpful. Everybody's coming to you asking what to do. And between you and I, right, you're going to know the people who are going to be better at handling a power drill than other people, right? So put the people not so good at power drills with costumes and put the people who are good um, with power drill drills up there. And then this just makes sure that all of those things get done um, and really helps to make the whole day go well. So yeah, this was just a strike assignment. So I would definitely encourage that. Be sure to organize volunteers. Um, you know, I know that we had kind of talked about before, you know, like a building thing, how do you requ uh, require people to do it? Again, I keep hearkening back to Marymount. Um, they have a really good policy of the next production. They need to come and help with strike, which is great. Um, board members, the production team, and you can make it mandatory. Um, my suggestion for making it mandatory is definitely to make it mandatory with a timing that would work for everyone. I know that lots of people have talked about 
you know, the day after, no, everybody's partying the night of the day after is probably you're going to get a weird group of people who are able to come. Um, again, I keep hearkening back to Marymount. They do a good thing of the last show is a matinee. And so everybody comes that evening and you just stay to do it, which I think really works well. And then always provide food, right? I mean, who doesn't love pizza, obviously. All right. So um, to the classic question, how to adjudicate producers, much like Mary, I have no idea. I, there is so much behind the scenes. There is so much going on beforehand, before the actual, you know, once an adjudicator goes to see the show, so much has already been done and the producer is probably pretty hands off by that point that you may not even see them and so you think that they're not involved. Um, but for real, uh, my, my adjudicator, I guess, knowledge, whatever that means, I would, again, hearken to Mary and definitely encourage standardizing producer responsibilities. I think every community theater is different on what they expect from a producer. Um, and sometimes that makes it more difficult or less difficult, depending on where you are. Um, I would encourage a, an adjudicator to review a list of responsibilities at each location. Like I said, Footlighters has a list of what they expect producers to do, and you get one producer from them and one producer that the director gets to assign or whatever. Um, at Marymount, the producer gets a list of the things that they're gonna do, and you can see what they're doing uh, type of thing. Uh, definitely talk to the director. Like I said, the producer is the right hand of the director. Um, you're gonna hear from them how that went um, and talk to the board. The producer should be regularly in touch with lots of different people and if they never heard for them, from them, they probably weren't doing what they were supposed to do. And like I had mentioned before, look at the program. Um, if the producer is everything, then they really haven't done their job. They've just volunteered to do everything, which isn't what they're supposed to do. Now you could, um, have an experience like we did, which was uh, around the world in 80 days where we had so many great people and yet still that tech week was insanity, right? Um, but we managed to go all the way to Kokomo, we did. And that is, uh, that is us over here getting ready to go to Kokomo, which is crazy. So, um, but unfortunately I don't have a lot of, I mean, I, unfortunately it would be asking other people and it makes it so difficult. And I know that adjudicating is so hard um, because at the end of it, we all sit there hoping we get an orchid, right? And it's so difficult to say who did what. So I would definitely talk to the director and the board. And then this is my final slide. I feel like this, it, this has been shared with me as a producer. I feel like this is exactly what producing is and it's my favorite. Um, so, uh, producing is easy. It's like riding a bike, except the bike is on fire. You are on fire. Everything is on fire and you are in hell. Um, so anyway, questions. That's all I got. I'm gonna take a swig of bubbly there. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. Um, I certainly echo those sentiments. Um, we appreciate that. I wanna, before we, I, I know there are some people gonna that are gonna be putting their thoughts into the comment section um, to share questions with Kristen. I encourage you guys to do that right now. Um, in the meantime, I would like to reiterate, Kristen brought up communicating. It is okay as an adjudicator to ask questions to your judging assistant. It really is okay. Um, and in my experience, producers really do step up and have to fill in in gaps in emergency situations. And sometimes programs are not up to date. So it is really important that you communicate not only with maybe the judging assistant to get that information, but also um, it's up to the groups and the producers to get that information to Fred um, so that we aren't giving awards to individuals that are not actually doing those positions. Um, because sometimes programs go into print and then, oops, Kristen is the customer. So, <laughs> so make sure that um, you're really communicating with your, with your groups is really, really important. But as an adjudicator, I would not recommend you contacting the director directly. <laughs> I apologize. I, I've no, never adjudicated. Okay. I mean, you probably could, and in the sense, it would, I, but I think bottom line is we have um, Fred and really Laureen and really anybody on the on the long range judging committee. You as adjudicators, please use us as resources. We we have adjudicators come to us all the time with questions on, hey, I don't know how to phrase this section. Will you help me? Or oh, I'm not sure about this. And we really can be that middleman for you with these groups to get information for you. 
Um, so I really encourage you to lean on judging assistants and the long range judging committee for any questions that you have uh, during your writing process. All right, let's see what we got. Um, okay, well, a lot of them are comments, which actually are kind of funny. And I just want to share this one from Jim because it's a really funny comment. So Jim says, some call it tech week, some call it hell week. I combine the two and call it heck week. I just thought that was kind of funny. I agree. I agree. <laughs> um, Elaine shares a recommendation about um, sharing info with a private uh, Facebook group. There are a lot of people who use different um, social media platforms, and that might be something beneficial. And I encourage groups to also look at maybe what the producer is doing on public Facebook groups, too, because I think there are a lot of um, marketing type stuff that producers are doing now, too. You mentioned publicity photos and things like that. And as an adjudicator, I can see that and I could see, OK, what has my producer been putting out there to the public? And that's something that you can tangibly talk about on maybe your your um, your writing, although she does. Uh, you know, somebody here says, um, don't assume that everybody has Facebook, though, because not everybody does. So just something to keep in um, just kind of keep in mind. But I don't see any other questions. Laureen and Dan, do you guys have anything that you'd like to add? Well, I do want to thank Kristen for doing the same thing that Mary did, because what we discovered was it was really difficult for the adjudicators to adjudicate and respond to a producer because they didn't know what a producer really did. And that's that's leading me into saying I hope that we have some group presidents and some group members that are watching today. Um, how important it is to us when we ask you to please give us some information to put there for adjudicators, how important that is. Because if they don't know what your producer is doing, it's very difficult for them to respond, to say whether they've done a good job or an award-winning job or a less than good job. So um, it, it was very concise and very helpful. And, um, and I hope that it was confirming to a lot of people that, you know, even if they're not calling that particular thing that's being done the producer's job, they're seeing what Mary was saying about, well, then please be as specific as you can, because somebody's doing that job. Sure. Somebody's doing yeah. the that, all the things that you put together as being producers. And so. I, I definitely would say by the time that you are seeing the show and that you are adjudicating it, the producer is probably mostly out of the picture. I mean, they've they're there and organizing some things, but you know, where we do so much work on the front end that by the time that you are actually sitting in the theater and watching it, like I said, I didn't go to every performance. I split that with my director. You know what I mean? You're coming in and out because you're trying to organize things or I would only be at the end and you wouldn't see me anyway because I was setting up a meal for the in between. You know what I mean? So like it's just it's a lot of different things and by the time that you adjudicate it we're probably yeah <laughs> but the end result i mean honestly in community theater the end result is a lot on the director but the end result is yeah. also a lot on the producer so what's coming out there is the overall production yeah um is coming from those basically those two human beings with a lot of help from their stage manager yes. um but yeah. that it does help because i think that uh, I'm, I'm so excited today about approaching those two jobs those two responsibilities in theater that we tend to shy from because it is so all over the board and both you and mary helped us to put some um some parameters around that and that is absolutely excellent so dan amanda you guys have anything else no i i just want to thank everybody who presented today um kristen and mary and forrest and chad um, i found all of the presentations incredibly entertaining and informative um, I feel like I, I thought I knew a lot about theater and I felt like I learned so much today. Um, and I'm really grateful for everybody who tuned in. Um, I think we had about 25 or 30 people tuning in and uh, this will be available on our ACT YouTube page. Uh, so we can reference these videos anytime. Uh, if you wanna go back and, and see what Chad talked about or Forrest or, or anybody. Um, and I think we have a good jumping off point for some of these discussions, uh, particularly with stage managing and, and producing and things that maybe ACT Cincinnati can do for the groups mm -hmm. uh, moving forward. And I think that's really important. Yep. And I'm going to thank the Long Range Judging Committee, Dan, Fred Hunt, Doug Berlon, Rose Van Den Einden, Michael Moorhead, and a very special thanks to our Amanda right there 
who um, ha was very kind to take on the responsibilities of making it all work virtually. If you really enjoyed today's forum and you want to help AFT to continue to do the things that they do, um, you can become a patron. Just go to accentcinnati.org, click that button for patrons, and down at the bottom of that page, you can donate and can help us to continue the work, especially in this time when none of us are alive and we're all trying to hang in there. And then um, you can revisit this um, particular um, forum today, as Dan said, um, and you can use this very link. And thank you, all of you, for joining us. And thanks, Amanda and Dan. You Everybody have a great evening.